Hi, students. This is a, a continuation of chapter 30 on atomic physics. This is a part three. Okay, so um, so far up till now, I mean, as I said earlier, uh, atomic physics and nuclear physics, uh, those are just applications of quantum physics. Quantum physics is the physics of the submicroscopic. So clearly the atom is part of what we would call submicroscopic. And so also would be, of course, the, the central part of the atom, the nucleus is a hundred thousand times smaller than the atom itself, all right? So what we've done so far in this chapter is I gave you a history of the atom, uh, essentially uh, everything from the ancient Greeks all the way to the work done by, um, by people like uh, the, the chemist uh, John Dalton and Lo Schmidt and, and others, Avogadro. And then of course the parts of the atom and that dealt with, you know, initially, uh, uh, Heinrich Geisler, the German glass blower and inventor, Heinrich Geisler, who made the very first ever uh, uh, gas discharge tube, and then of course William Crookes um, went uh, took took on the uh, and did real uh, scientific research on the uh, on uh, the gas discharge tube and essentially the current that goes through the gas discharge tube, which which excites the atoms with the elect with the electrons in the in the, um, in the electron beam collide with puts the atoms in an excited state, the atoms uh, then when their electrons descend to the ground state, give off photons. So that lights up, it creates a lit up path of the electron beam, right? And then after that, it was J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson did work to, uh, to essentially determine that the electron, that the, that the beam was composed of negative charged particles called electrons. But he could not get the mass or the charge all because they didn't know the mass or the, they, I mean, those are two things they did not know. So all J.J. Thompson could do was get the charge to mass ratio. And it took some other work to get the electric charge. So that was work done by the American physicist, Robert A. Milliken, who uh, did the famous oil drop experiment to, uh, to determine the electric charge, the fundamental electric charge, which is also the fundamental electric charge, not just of the electron, but also of the proton, all right? Plug that into J.J. Thompson's um, calculation. And what you now have is the, not just the charge of the electron, we also have the mass of the electron. And you also get the mass of the proton. And he also, and we also, we already knew that what the ratio was. We already knew that the proton was 1,836 times the mass of the electron. So all of this stuff we know. And then there was the work done by er, Lord Ernest Rutherford and his graduate students. And they shot, you know, they, and by this time, 1896 had, had already rolled around. And we already knew about nuclear decay. We already knew that there was these highly energetic particles that come out of the that come out of the atom for whatever reason. We didn't know at the time. One of them is the alpha particle. The alpha particle, for some reason, comes out of the atom at five MeV. And so, what J.J. Thompson did is he used that as an, as a source and shot alpha particles at gold foil. And he was fully expecting them. at the time. J.J. Thompson had come up with the plum pudding model. And his model was that, oh, you know, electrons and protons are just mixed in there in like a, in a plum pudding. And they fully expected most of the electrons to be hardly be deflected at all. And yet, and, and, ma and many of the electrons were not. However, it was found that some of the electrons were deflected at very large angles, some straight back at the source. And so with enough uh, further measurements, it was determined that that the, that the alpha particle is hitting a very massive object. In fact, it was determined that the, almost the entire mass of the atom was located in an extremely dense nucleus, which is about 100,000 times smaller than the atom. And so we left off the last lecture by um, understanding, essentially, um, uh, we have the, uh, planetary model of the atom that was devised by Rutherford. And Niels Bohr very much liked that. He, in fact, he spent 19, an entirety of 1912 working in Rutherford's laboratory. He used the planetary model of the atom to devise the first ever, we call it the old quantum theory. And again, it's the planetary model where the, where the uh, it was formed, it was uh, just like the um, uh, model after the solar system. Solar system, you have 
majority of the mass of the solar system is in the sun, the central sun, and the low, lower mass planets orbit the sun in nice perfect orbits. Well, we, um, the atom would, would be the central mass was the, was the nucleus where all the protons live. We didn't know about nu neutrons yet. And electrons would orbit the nucleus in very nice elliptical or very nice circular orbits. And Bohr was able to use that model to very uh, accurately describe uh, many different uh, uh, aspects of the hydrogen atom. He used that model to describe correctly describe all of the energy levels of hydrogen, all the quantized energy levels, all the orbits. And in fact, he was able to describe the line spectra, the absorption and emission line spectra of hydrogen, discrete line spectra. He was able to describe it perfectly. And however, there was limitations to his theory in that you can only use his theory for hydrogen. If you go through, you know, to the next next atom up, um, helium, lithium, you know, beryllium, so on and so forth, you can't use this theory anymore. You can only use this theory if there's only one electron. So you could have hydrogen, once ionized helium, twice ionized lithium, thrice or three times ionized beryllium, so on and so forth. As long as you have a nucleus of atomic number C and there's one electron going around, you can use Bohr's theory. So it had limitations. Bohr's theory is what we refer to as semi-classical. There are quantum mechanical ideas in Bohr's theory versus angular momentum is quantized. Never before did anybody think that was true. Energies are quantized. Orbits are quantized. However, uh, one of the issues with Bohr's theory is that Bohr's theory demanded that um, electrons travel in well-defined circular paths. That's a violation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If, it, if, it, if the electron does travel along a well-defined circular path, that means that we can tell where the electron is with infinite precision. We cannot do that. Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that you cannot know what the what the position of a particle is or its or its momentum to any better than the multiplication of the uncertainty in the position times the uncertainty of momentum has to be greater than or equal to h over four pi. So there is a natural level of ignorance impo Im imposed on us by the universe. The def the electron definitely has a location, but the universe does not allow us to know what that location is. All right. So what really is true is that the electron is in a probability cloud. And you can only know the probability of an electron. And again, I, as I told you, you solve the Schrodinger equation, you find the wave function, you take the complex square of the wave function that satisfies a particular Schrodinger equation, and you get the probability distribution function. So everything is based on probability. All right, now, not, you know, we, we are able to use the Bohr theory, not just because, you know, we, we have people use the Bohr theory today for hydrogen. It works. I mean, you get answers. But we can also use the Bohr theory to describe x rays. Again, in the last, you know, we also we know that, yeah, you might say to yourself, okay, tungsten is 74 protons and 74 electrons. How do you use the Bohr theory? You're, you just told me that you can only use it for one electron. Well, the approximation that you make, again, remember with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, X-rays is that in the X-ray tube, a hot filament has um, electrons that get ejected because of thermal agitation. Those electrons are accelerated due to the high potential source and crash into the, the anode material, the target. Now, most of the X-rays are given up by, uh, by the, what's called breaking radiation, or in German, it's called Bremsstrahlung. And so because the accelerating charges radiate, most of the um, radiation is given off in the smooth Bremsstrahlung curve. However, there are the characteristic X-ray frequencies. And those are free characteristic of the actual materials atoms itself. And those frequencies are caused by what? They're caused because some of these electrons that are accelerated crash right into the atom itself, excite an uh, N equals one or N equals two level or K or L, L, L level electron, knock it out of its out of its uh, out of its shell, either into a higher position than the atom or completely knock it out of the atom altogether, leaving a vacancy. Be but but we're going to find out by the what's called the Pauli exclusion principle that every electron in an atom has a partner. They all come in terms of pairs, and so given that you know you're talking about lower level. Um, uh, lower level uh, uh, orbital, um, the electron, there's, a, there's an electron that's left behind. 
and there's a vacancy. And so what happens with the electro with the X-ray is that some some electron from a higher level drops into that vacancy. However, you can use the Bohr model, but you can't use the atomic number Z. You have to adjust for the for the partner electron that's left behind. So you see Z minus one. You don't have to worry about all the other charges because they act like a conductor. They're screened. The only charge you have to really worry about is the main charge of the nucleus itself and corrected for the partner electron that's left behind. Okay. And we were able to get very, very good values of X-ray photons. So again, the energies of the photons given off when the electron makes this electron uh, or um, uh, energy level transition is in the X-ray region. That's how you get X-rays. Okay, now we're already have seen that a lot of physics that we that we um, have in our day-to-day -day lives are based upon energy levels. Quantum mechanics is everywhere. So we're gonna now look at uh, concepts of how do energy levels, uh, energy levels and their excitations and de-excitations affect our regular lives, all right? So that's what this is about. And then we're gonna talk particularly about what's called fluorescence and phosphorescence. And after that, we're gonna lead into a, a talk, we're gonna lead into a discussion of X-rays, all right? So um, we're gonna talk about atomic excitations and de-excitations. All right, so before we even start discussing anything, let's talk about what this even means. What does it mean, an excitation? What does that mean? So, so imagine for a moment, I draw a couple pictures. I'm gonna draw a before picture and after picture. So before, and I'm gonna simplify things to say, I have, an, I have an atom that has two energy levels. Okay, I'm just gonna simplify things. I have two energy levels of this atom. So again, this represents the energy levels of an atom. I have a lower energy level E1 and an upper energy level E2. Let's imagine that the electron initially is in level E1. And I have a photon out here. Again, you always draw photons a little wavy line. That's the way physicists do it. And, and it's just the right photon, just the right energy difference. It's an energy difference. It's a, a, a photon is an energy. It's like a key going into a lock. All right. So this photon, we're going to say, has an energy level. Let's see here. It's going to be delta E. Okay, I'm talking about the photon is equal to, or let's say, E photon, photon has energy given by delta E, just the right energy uh, to equal E2 minus E1, which is HF. Okay, remember. Photons always, energy is always equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. Has that right frequency. All right, comes in, oh, yep, that's right frequency. The frequency, what's going to happen now, is going to be called absorption. And so what's going to happen now is that the photon will, will actually, uh, so again, this is a photon, in case I didn't make that clear. So it's a photon from electromagnetic radiation coming in, and it's just the right frequency that just equals the, the change in the energy levels. What happens, the photon vanishes. And my after picture is no photon any longer. Now I have the atom and the electron is now in the upper energy level. It has been promoted. This is called an atomic excitation. All right, so this is um, what, what we're saying that now the electron is in an excited state. This is called an atomic excitation. What it means is that the electron, or sorry, the atom, the atom in the after picture is said to be in, in, a, in an excited state. So the atom in the after picture is set to be in an excited state. All 
right? So this, this electron now, this atom, okay, again, this atom is, you know, atoms are again, are, are given by, they're depicted by their corresponding energy levels. They all have unique energy levels. And so now we have an electron that normally would live down in a lower energy level, but now it's in an excited state. Now, generally speaking, electrons only live in an excited state for about 10 to the negative eight seconds. Then they uh, spontaneously, uh, nobody knows when this is gonna happen. Again, this is Heisenberg's, uncertain, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. No, nobody in the universe knows when this atom will, will go from the higher state to lower state. It's all based on probability, but we know it will happen. We can't tell you exactly when, right? And so again, the electron, the atoms in this excited state, it'll descend to its lower state, okay, in about 10 to the negative eight seconds. When it descends down, it gives off a photon of just the right frequency equal to that energy level again. And we call that a D excitation. All right, so now I'm gonna draw two more pictures. Okay, this is all about excitation. Now I'm gonna refer to now, I'm gonna talk about what's called atomic D excitation. Sorry. So now we're gonna, so atomic D excitation, how does it work? Well, we start off with the atom now and its higher energy level, right? The electron is in E2, which is greater than E1. So now we start off with the atom. This is our before picture. The atom is in its excited state, all right? Now what's going to happen is spontaneously, the, atom, the electron is going to descend to its lower state. So, so um, let me write this a little higher. I can write some stuff here. So. Again, this is atomic de excitation. All right. So an atom, or we'll say an electron, it usually exists. In a higher, uh, in an excited state or an excited energy state, before it descends to the lower energy level. or usually about 10 to the negative eight seconds. And that's, that seems, you know, that, again, that seems like a tiny amount of time for us, but again, that's usually at the atomic level, that's, you know, that's typically uh, the kind of time frame. So our after picture then, is gonna be what? Well, it's gonna look like the inverse of what I wrote up earlier. So now what's going to happen is spontaneously, called spontaneous emission. We'll talk more about this in a moment. Spontaneously, the electron is just going to descend downward to the lower state. But when that happens, there's a corresponding photon of just right energy that's given off. So now we have a photon that's going to be given off. And that photon is going to have delta, uh, it's going to have an energy. E photon just the right energy equal E2 minus E1, which again is going to always given as Planck's constant times the frequency in accordance with Einstein's findings. All right, so again, this is what we refer to as spontaneous emission. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. All right. We don't know when this is going to happen. Again, quantum mechanics is all based upon probability. All we know is there's a probability it's going to happen. So the electron descends to the lower energy level and gives off a photon of just the right energy, energy equal to E2 minus E1. Okay, again, this is called an atomic de excitation. Now, it turns out that so many things around us are related to atomic excitations and de excitations. All right, 
So let's talk about that now. So again, this is what, what it's about. But let's kind of talk about, you know, what's how, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, you know, I, I always blew me away one time. I had, a, I had a boss one time who had kind of, uh, you know, knew I was studying quantum mechanics and, you know, smart, smart guy. He asked me a question one time, like, I don't see what, what, what the application of quantum mechanics is to the world. I'm like, well, um, look around you. As I told him, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I was kind of like, I, I was a little bit shocked, but again, it, you know, it's a computer scientist, not a, not a physicist, but anyway, I, it's one of those things that I, you know, I, I just, I mean, it's really quantum mechanics is clearly everywhere you look. Okay. So, um, so many properties of matter and phenomena in nature are directly related to atomic energy levels. And it was just what we had talked about a moment ago. So many, many, many properties of matter. Not, you know, so many properties of matter. Again, we, we talk about the energy levels. Again, they're all about, you know, the energy levels, quantum mechanics. I mean, atomic physics is quantum mechanics, all right? So many properties of matter and phenomena in nature Um, <clears throat> are directly related to atomic energy level. And uh, there are associated excitations and de-excitations. And just like I said, all right. So again, many properties, oops, many properties of matter. <laughs> Sorry about that. Write that more, more nicely. Many properties of many properties of matter and phenomena in nature are directly related to atomic energy levels and their associated excitations and de excitations. So again, so for instance, the color of a rose, the output of a laser, the transparency of air are some examples. So so again, you know, uh, so, something's color, the color of a rose. How a laser works, we'll talk about that in the, in the, in the next, in the next uh, subsection. The output of a laser. And the uh, transparency of air. Are some examples. All right, so. Things that we take for granted, colors of things, like a color of a red rose or a yellow rose or so. The output of a laser, you know, how a laser works, all of that, dealing with energy levels. Transparency of air, why is air transparent? Again, that deals with energy levels that do not exist in air to absorb photons, all right? So again, we're gonna talk all about this right now. So, so for instance, let's, let's start talking about, let's talk about the color of a material first. So the color of a material is due to the, to the ability of its atoms to absorb certain wavelengths while reflecting or re-emitting others. I mean, why is the material, why is something a certain color? Because of that. So the color of a material.
The color of a material is due to the ability of its atoms to absorb certain wavelengths. <clears throat> Not so great. Color of a material is due to the ability of its atoms and molecules uh, to, uh, to absorb certain wavelengths while reflecting or rebating others. So uh, for instance, you look at a tomato, tomato is red, right? So a tomato absorbs all, so a red tomato, and usually all red anyway, but we'll be specific. A red tomato absorbs uh, photons or visible wavelengths, all visible wavelengths except, except for red. Why is that? All right, so tomato absorbs all visible wavelengths except for red. And that's because the atoms, so again, you know, there's a pigment, natural pigment in tomato. Uh, the atoms um, of the hydrocarbon pigment lysopene. So the atoms of the hydrocarbon pigment lysopene. So this has all is has energy levels separated by a variety of energies corresponding to all the other visible photons except for red. So, hydro, so atoms of the, hydro, of, of the hydrocarbon lyso, pigment lysopene inside of tomato uh, has energies such that energy levels exist or has energy 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 let's write it differently <laughs> has energy levels so the hydrocarbon pigment lysopene has energy levels whose differences allow for the absorption of all photons so allow for uh, allow for the absorption of photons of all wavelengths except for red. which gets reflected. And so our, our eyes see that red light. And that's why a tomato appears red. Because it, lysopene has all the other energies where the energy levels of any other photon, yellow, blue, green, you name it, you name it they get absorbed. But there's no energy level 
There's no, there's no energy delta, there's no delta E existing among the energy levels that will absorb a red photon. So we see red, we see the reflected red. Okay, again, the very color of something is because of that there's, there's energy levels present for all the other photons to be absorbed, but not for red, for instance, for the tomato. And we see something that appears yellow, like you have a yellow shirt. Well, the dye in that shirt has energy levels such that all the other photons get absorbed, except yellow, right? And that gets reflected. So that's why things appear a certain color. That's how pigments work. All right. Um, how about let's talk about the transparency of air. Again, this 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 applies to anything that has a color. All right. So what I just got them talking about here, anything that has a color, uh, this is why. Why is air transparent? Well, air air is transparent to visible light, as we know. So air is transparent to visible light. Okay. Um, because there are few energy levels that visible photons can excite. Um, in air molecules and atoms. There's no energy levels that are available that can be excited. All right, so visible light cannot be absorbed. So air cannot absorb visible light. Uh, furthermore, the visible light is only weakly scattered by air because the visible wavelengths are so much greater in their size than the air molecules and atoms. All right. So again, the visible light, another property, visible light uh, is only weakly scattered by air. Um, because visible wavelengths are so much greater in size than air molecules and atoms. Uh, in fact, light has to pass through kilometers of air to scatter enough to cause the red sunsets and the blue skies that we're usually accustomed to. We know that's caused by scattering of air, but, that's, but light has to pass through kilometers of air to make that happen, right? So light actually has to pass, so light, because it's so weakly scattered, light has to pass through kilometers of air. <clears throat> OK. 
kilometers of error to give the red sun sets in a blue sky. All right, so, so error, so we talked about, you know, things having colors because of energy levels. Well, the transparency of things are due to the lack of the available energy level. So for instance, air is transparent to visible light because there are very few energy levels that visible photons can actually excite in air molecules and atoms. They don't exist. So air passes right through. Air cannot be absorbed at visible light. And then air beyond that is very weakly scattered uh, by, uh, so visible light is only weakly scattered by air because the wavelengths of visible light are so much greater than the size of air molecules and atoms. So they're not gonna, so again, you're, you're much more easily scattered if, if something is the same size as you, but, the air, but if, the, if, the, if the wavelengths of the photons are significantly larger then what's scattering them, the air is just gonna pass right through and hardly be affected at all. I mean, again, it, it, they will be scattered, of course, because that's why we have blue skies and red sunsets, but it takes kilometers, of, um, it takes light to pass through kilometers of air to make that happen. All right, now, I said we're gonna talk about fluorescence and phosphorescence, so that, let's go into that now. So again, this is just the, the fact that things that are transparent or things that have colors, that's all due to quantum mechanics. Something has a color, because of energy levels in quantum mechanics. Something is transparent because of energy levels or lack thereof. Again, another application of quantum mechanics. So if someone tells you, where does quantum mechanics have come into play? Well, you can say, well, your, your red shirt is quantum mechanical. I mean, that's all you really have. Anything that's a color, that's quantum mechanics, all right? Okay, so what is fluorescence? So the ability to of materials to emit various wavelengths of light is similar related to the atomic energy levels. So again, we talked about absorbing uh, light, but also we have to talk about de-excitations and emitting light, all right? So again, it works both ways, and it also deals with quantum mechanics. So, so the ability of materials to emit various wavelengths of light not just absorb, but also emit. Wavelengths of light. So the ability of materials to emit various wavelengths of light is similarly, similarly related to the, the, its atomic energy levels. So in the fluorescence process, for instance, how, how does that work? Well, in the fluorescence process, you have an atom and it gets, um, it gets uh, struck by a high energy ultraviolet photon. That, that photon will promote an electron into a, uh, an, ex, uh, an excited state that's several levels above the one at which it started. All right, and so what happens is, well, now you have a vacancy. Well, the, the um, electron can, has multiple different ways to de-excite. Again, it's been excited to energy levels that are significantly higher than the one in which, originally, in which it really, in which it originally uh, was in. So it could, for instance, go straight right back down to the ground state, and it would emit a photon of exactly the same uh, frequency which which promoted promoted it in the first place, or more uh, more commonly, it descends back down in multiple steps, and what it does is it absorbs it, it emits. I'm sorry, uh, photons of lower energy, most oftentimes in the visible spectrum, and so the object appears to glow. That is called fluorescence. All right. And so the whole fluorescence process, this whole concept of, 
of glowing, something glowing or emitting light uh, is due to energy levels, which is quantum mechanics, all right? So in the fluorescence process, I just said, let me um, erase this. Okay, so in the, fluores in the fluorescence process, Again, we're talking about fluorescence now. In the fluorescence process, an atom is excited to a level several steps above its ground state. Remember, the ground state is n equals one, the very bottom state. So an atom is excited uh, to a level several steps above its ground state. Um, and that's usually by the absorption of a relatively high energy UV photon. Again, absorbs a high energy UV photon. UV meaning ultraviolet, of course. And the electron is promoted not just one level up, but multiple levels up. Because why? Because the UV photon has a lot of energy. So again, the energy is it's a key that opens the lock, right? If, if uh, that UV photon happens to match a particular you know, set of energy levels that are far apart, then that, uh, that electron is going to get promoted right up there, those, that higher energy level. So now you have an electron that's in a very high level, not going to exist for very long, and it's going to come back down. All right. So again, most cases, electron stays in a in, in an excited state, or atom stays in an excited state for on the order of ten to the negative eight seconds. So not very long, that's, but that's your typical lifetime of an excited state. So uh, once it is excited, the atom can de-excite in several ways. Um, and one of which is just to re-emit a photon of the same energy that excited it. So, so one of which is to directly transfer uh, straight back to the ground state. And re emit a UV photon of the same energy that excited it. That's one, that's one possibility. All right. Now, another possibility and, and the most more likely possibility is that that electron is so high up now, that electron can come back down in, in several different steps. That's usually what happens, right? So again, if it goes all the way back down to the excited state, it's gonna, it's gonna emit a high energy photon, a UV photon. But let's just say that it can also, it can also come back down in multiple steps. And those steps would, would, uh, would then emit lower energy photons. So more likely,
the electron, the promoted electron, in the excited atom can descend back to the ground state in multiple steps. emitting lower energy photons in the process. Many of which are visible. You know, again, because lower energy means longer wavelengths. So it's not gonna be in the ultraviolet, they'll likely be in the visible. And the material will emit visible light. Okay. So again, this 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 is a set. So the set the step those steps taken by the atom, all right, well, those are DX citations, I already talked about that. Fluorescence is this process. So the concept of fluorescence, fluorescence is defined to be the process in which the atom or molecule is excited by a photon of a given energy, D excites by emission to, to a lower energy, by, uh, by the emission of a lower energy photon, all right? So fluorescence, is the process um, by which an atom or molecule, um, by which an atom or molecule um, excited by a photon of a given energy, Um, D excites by emission of a lower energy photon. That process is called fluorescence. Fluorescent. Sorry. So, so again, as I said, a, a high energy UV photon uh, interacts with an atom, promoting an electron to a, a uh, to an energy level several steps higher than its ground state. And again, there's multiple ways that the electron can de the excited electron can de excite. One could be to go literally making a de excitation straight from the that the high energy state to back to a ground state by in a single step emitting a photon of the, of the same energy that promoted in the first place, or more likely the promoted electron um, in the excited state atom can descend back to the ground state in multiple steps, emitting lower energy photons in a process, many of which are visible, and the material will emit visible light that way. Fluorescence is this process by which the atom de-excites by, uh, 
uh, by the emission of lower energy photons, energy lower than the photon that excited it in the first place. That process is called fluorescence. All right. So again, fluorescence, we call it, we talk about fluorescent lights, fluorescence is a concept of quantum mechanics utilizing energy levels. Okay, um, <clears throat> fluorescence can be induced in many types of energy input, all right? So, so for instance, uh, fl there's fluorescent paints, dyes, and even soap residues and clothes can make colors seem brighter in sunlight by converting some of the UV into, into visible light. So again, there's many, many different types of, um, you know, applications of fluorescence. So for instance, you know, you can have fluorescent paint. Uh, dyes and even soap residue left in clothes. So they can they can they, they can make colors seem brighter in sunlight. So fluorescent paint dyes and even soap residue in clothes uh, can make colors seem brighter. In sunlight. By uh, converting some of the UV into visible light, same process. All right, so again, fluorescent paint, dyes, and even soap residue uh, left in clothing uh, after they're washed uh, can make colors seem brighter in sunlight by converting some of the UV into visible lights. Again, these are the same fluorescent processes. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, common fluorescent lights use electric discharge and mercury vapor to cause atomic emissions from mercury atoms, all right? And so inside of the fluorescent light is, it's coated with a fluorescent material that emits visible light over a broad spectrum of wavelengths, right? And so again, we always talk about fluorescent lights. So how do they work? Well, again, there is, um, so, you, you know, neon lights are, you know, or, well, you go back, I guess. Uh, you have electric discharge induced fluorescence. So let me go back one here. So electric discharge, we talk about electric discharge tubes. Electric discharge um, can induce fluorescence. Um, as in the so-called so neon light. Okay, um, and in gas discharges that produce atomic molecular spectra that we talked about. Okay, um, we also know that there, we, have, we we've oftentimes talk about fluorescent lights. A lot of times, you know, if we're meeting face, if we were meeting face to face, we'd have fluorescent lights in the classrooms, right? Or you have them in the offices. So common fluorescent lights 
And we always talk, always talk about fluorescent lights, the common fluorescent lights. You now you always look at a fluorescent light. I mean, I have some in my house, you know, what do they look like? They're not your typical screw in light bulbs. They're, they're like a gas discharge tube is what they are, right? So fluorescent light is a gas discharge tube if you look at it. So a common fluorescent lights use atomic discharge and mercury vapor. They're discharge tubes. Cathode and a nano and mercury vapor. There's mercury vapor in that discharge tube. And it causes atomic excitations from mercury out of Um, the inside of the fluorescent light is coated with a fluorescent material. So you notice that they, there's a special material on the inside of that light. The inside of the fluorescent light is coated with a fluorescent material. And, um, and that emit, it emits light over a broad spectrum of wavelengths. <clears throat> wavelengths. All right, so again, the electric discharge uh, can induce fluorescence. And we see that in the so-called neon lights and in gas discharge too that, that, that we studied earlier, uh, like in the talking about the Bohr model that produced the atomic and molecular spectra, the line spectrum. And then we have the, the fluorescent lights. Common fluorescent lights use atomic discharge of mercury vapor. So again, you look at a fluorescent light, it's, it's you know, it, it looks like, you know, it's, it's um, Long tube. And what's it do? It plugs in. You have a cathode and an anode. And electric discharge goes across and, it, and essentially gives off, uh, mercury vapor gives off uh, a line spectra. The fluorescent material uh, emits light over a broad spectrum of wavelengths. So again, this is in your very office or home. I have some in my house. We have this gas discharge tube um, that contain mercury. And the mercury atoms uh, get excited to the, uh, into energy levels. They descend into a particular line spectra for mercury. And the fluorescent material will give off a broad range of wavelengths. Now, we can also, if we so choose, you know, we have the, the bright light, you know, fluorescent lights that we, that we usually like, but we can also. We can also uh, change the coating. Instead of giving off a broad spectrum of wavelengths, we can say, well, let's, let's make it more like sunlight or the reddish glow of candlelight, depending upon your, your mood, right? And so you can actually make fluorescent lights that have a different coating that can give off different wavelengths if you so choose. That's an opportunity, that's an option for you too. All right, and so, now, for example, by choosing uh, by choosing a, an appropriate coating for fluorescent for fluorescent lights,
Um, you know, uh, they can they can be made to be more like sunlight. They can be made to emit light more like sunlight or candlelight, if you wish. Or uh, like a reddish glow of candlelight. Depending on your needs. If you're making a dinner restaurant, you might want more of the candlelight. All right, so again, you can choose different coatings to emit different wavelengths of light. Again, that's that's op opportunity that you have. Now, fluorescent lights are quite efficient. They're much more efficient than incandescent filaments. They're about four times more efficient. That's another good thing about them. They're more efficient than incandescent lights. So that's another positive thing. You're trying to, you know, trying to be energy efficient. Fluorescent lights would be a better way to go. Many, many times that's why offices use them, because their lights are on all the time. So fluorescent lights are about four times more efficient than incandescent lights. All right, so again, there's a lot more efficiency uh, with, fluorescent, with fluorescent lights. Um, and, uh, and the black body radiation from uh, incandescent lights is typically mostly in infrared anyway, right? So the black body radiation uh, from Incandescent lights is mostly in the infrared anyway. Doesn't do you any good. I mean, it's it's good for heating something. So if you want something just to emit light, then Fluorescent lights is a, is a better option for you. Now, the, um, these, so for an example, you know, fluorescence occurs in nature as well. And so we have, we have fluorescence in our, you know, in our technology, but fluorescence also occurs in nature. There's some, there's some uh, animals that are naturally fluorescent. All right. So for instance, uh, the White Waitomo Caves in North Island, New Zealand, provide a natural habitat for glow, for glow worms. So the Waitomo, I believe it's pronounced, Waitomo uh, Caves on North Island in New Zealand. Uh, provide a natural habitat for glowworms. All right, so 
the, uh, the glow worms hang up to 70 silk threads of about 30 to 40 centimeters each to trap prey. So the glow worms So the glow worms uh, hang up, hang up, set about, have, hang up seventy silk threads of about thirty to forty centimeters each. trap prey. That flies toward them in the dark. Okay, um, the fluorescence process is very efficient for glowworms. It's nearly 100% energy input turning into light. Um, in the case of flore our fluorescent lights are only about 20%. So the fluorescent, the fluorescence process, I mean, again, which a lot to learn from nature, the fluorescence process, in glowworms, is about 100% in uh, changing energy input to light. In comparison, our fluorescent lights are only about 20%. So comparison, fluorescent lights are only about 20% efficient. All right, so again, an example in nature, glowworms, all right? So again, there's a Waitomo, Waitomo Caves in North Island, New Zealand, uh, provide the natural habitat for glowworms. Glowworms can hang up to about 70 silk threads, about 30 to 40 centimeters each to trap prey. So it flies toward them in the dark and the glowworms glow, as the name implies. They, they glow by fluorescence and their energy, and they're about 100% about efficient. And, um, Actually, I guess uh, should be the word efficient should be right there. They're about 100 percent efficient in changing energy input to light. Your pairs and fluorescent lights are only about 20 percent efficient. All right. So fluorescence has a has a lot of uh, use in biology and medicine. You know, we humans tend to use this so again. It naturally occur, occurs in nature. A uh, good example would be glowworms. Um, fluorescence has many uses in biology and medicine.
Um, it's commonly used to label and follow a molecule within a cell, for instance. So it's commonly used Commonly used falls into weird patterns. All right. Commonly used um, to label. Hang on one second. Got in a weird state for some reason. All right, sorry about that. All right, again, as I was saying, um, right. commonly used to uh, label um, and follow a molecule within a cell. All right, so we, we call this tagging. Uh, so this tagging allow, uh, allows one to study the structure of DNA and proteins. Larson's, Larson tagging. Again, fluorescent tagging is used in biology. And a lot of you guys are interested in biology. Um, we can also use fluorescent dyes and antibodies are usually used um, to tag the molecules which are then illuminated with UV light and their emission of visible light is observed. Um, so again, such fluorescence of each element is characteristic. You can actually use this characteristic uh, identific to uh, the, char the characteristic fluorescence to identify what the element is in a sample, for instance. All right, and so again, we use this in biology. So fluorescent dyes and antibodies. Um, are usually used to tag the molecules. So how do you tag it? Well, fluorescent dyes and antibodies. And then um, you can illuminate that with UV light and then see what the emission 
of the visible items, right? So you should use the fluorescent dyes and antibodies or use the tag the molecules, uh, which are then illuminated. by UV light <clears throat> okay and their emission of visible light is observed So you tag uh, atoms or DNA or proteins with fluorescent dyes or and antibodies, and, and then you illuminate uh, those, those tags with, uh, with uh, ultraviolet light. And of course, what happens is, is the fluorescence process. The electrons in those, in those, in those materials become excited and they emit, uh, they emit um, uh, or they de-excite over a, um, in many steps, given off visible, visible photons. And you can follow, you can, you can see the visible photons and hence you can follow where, you know, your special tagged uh, molecules are, 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 are going or where they are. Okay. Um, and also, since the fluorescence of each element is characteristic, Identification elements within a sample can be done this way. All right. So again, just like characteristic X-rays, you have characteristic fluorescence. All right. So since the fluorescence uh, of each element is characteristic, you can look at the fluorescence pattern and know what the element is. Fluorescence of each element is characteristic. Um, identification of, el of, of elements within a sample can be done this way. Done this way. Yes. All right. Fluorescence used for tagging in biology. So now, again, as I said, once excited, the molecule usually de excites quickly. Okay. Usually a de excitation takes about 10 to the negative eight seconds, right? So again, this is just applications. Now we're going to talk. We're going to lead into the concept of phosphorescence in a, in a moment. So we're talking about fluorescence. But again, in any particular case, whether it's fluorescent or not, um, once excited, an atom, and I said this already, but we'll say it again, an atom usually de-excites. Uh, and, and around 10 to the negative eight seconds. About 10 to the negative eight seconds. So very short, very short lifetime in, a, in an excited state, all right? Now, this is called spontaneous excitation. And again, we would call this um, by spontaneous emission. Spontaneous meaning, I don't know when it's going to happen. I know the probability of it happening. I know it's going to happen because of Heisberg uncertainty principle. I know, uh, and there's a probability, but I can't tell you exactly when it's going to happen, right? And that's the nature of quantum mechanics. You only know that the probability of something happening, you don't know exactly when it will happen, all right? Now, um, there are some energy levels where the lifetimes are significantly longer. 
All right, some in, some energy levels allow um, um, uh, have significantly longer lifetimes. than usual, than the usual 10 to the negative eight seconds that we're used to. Some have significantly longer lifetimes. Uh, oftentimes it's the energy levels are inhibited and are slow and be exciting because their quantum numbers differ greatly from those that are available in lower energy levels. Again, we haven't talked about quantum numbers too much. But again, the quantum numbers that describe energy levels have to, there's, we're gonna later, later in this uh, chapter talk about what are called quantum mechanical selection rules. And in some cases, you know, when you have one energy level transition to another, the electron has to have the, has to be able to go to the right, um, right set of quantum numbers. If those quantum numbers are hard to get to, the uh, electron transition takes longer because it's harder to do. All right, so the energy levels, um, so, for instance, why? Well, the energy levels may uh, are maybe inhibited, or energy levels um, are inhibited And this will make more sense uh, when I talk about selection rules later on. They're more inhibited and are slow and de excited. Uh, because their quantum numbers differ greatly from those available at lower levels. And again, I'll talk, this will be, this will make more sense at the end of this lecture or at the end of this chapter. All right, um, and their their lifetimes. These you know the, their these lifetimes can be in around let's say ten to the negative three seconds. to minutes, to even hours. These, um, these states are said to be metastable. All right, metastable states. So again, once excited, an atom usually de-excites in about 10 to the negative eight sec, 10 to the negative eight seconds by what's called spontaneous emission. We'll talk a lot about this. We talk about lasers next. Some energy levels have significantly longer lifetimes than the usual 10 to negative eight, sec negative eight seconds. So again, usually that's because there is um, a difficult way. I mean, so again, to make a to make a transition, and we'll talk about these. We'll talk about selection rules later. Uh, there's a possibility that it is very difficult to find the right combination of quantum numbers. Again, what, the only quantum number we know about right now is a principal quantum number. 
but they're but we're going to study uh, we're going to talk about three other quantum numbers and so every every electron is given by an address of a set of quantum numbers unique set of quantum numbers in order to be able to go from one set of quantum numbers to another the in order to make a transition the electron has to be able to go from one set of quantum numbers to another some of those transitions are for are either forbidden or very hard to do and if they're very hard to do if the if the right quantum numbers are 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 very hard or very are, are, are not even available then that transition can take can be very uh, harder to do and and so the electron has to wait around in the upper energy level higher energy levels for a longer amount of time it could be like a millisecond all the way to minutes or even hours states like that are said to be metastable states where they have different lifetimes and they may be like short life they may seem like short lifetimes for us but compared with the typical 10 to the negative eight seconds is orders of magnitude greater all right so phosphorescence is a process by which an excited atom de-excites utilizing these metastable states all right and so when you talk about glow-in-the-dark materials for instance oftentimes you're looking at what's called phosphorescence Okay, so phosphorescence phosphorescence is the de excitation of a metastable state. Okay, so it involves metastable states. Uh, glow in the dark materials. Things we call glow in the dark material. <laughs> um, this is luminous dials on some watches and clocks. And, uh, and on children's toys and pajamas. Um, are made of phosphorescent substances. And uh, so visible, visible light excites the atoms and molecules in metastable states and decay very slowly, releasing stored excitation energy partially as visible light. So usually visible light will be what excites it. So visible light uh, excites the atoms and molecules in metastable states. Okay, and then um, that decay slowly. Uh, releasing the stored excitation energy partially as visible light. <clears throat> Word. 
citation in it. All right. So you don't need a UV photon for that. And, um, visible light will do the trick. And again, you will store a lot of this energy in metastable states. All right, so again, phosphorescence is a de-excitation of a metastable state. So again, you know, we see this in glow-in-the-dark materials, such as the luminous dials of some watches and clocks and on children's toys and pajamas. They're made out of phosphorescent substances. So again, visible light will excite the um, atoms and molecules in the phosphorescent material. Then they that, that energy is stored, those electrons, are, are um, you know, as a, as a child, let's say, wears pajamas around in a, in a lit up room, uh, electrons in the material, the atoms and molecules in the material are, are, ex, are um, promoted to the higher energy levels and, and they stay there. So then when the light source is no longer, no longer present, for instance, the, the child turns off the light in the dark, then his or her clothes will, will continue to glow because the electrons eventually, you know, um, over a longer, you know, they're in metastable states and they, and they, and they more slowly uh, uh, transition to lower, lower energy levels. And they, and, and they excite usually about the same types of photons that excited them. Those state, many of them are in a visible state. So again, they will be visible photons, but they'll take over, they'll be de-excited over a longer period of time because of the metastable state. That, the, that they're in because they're phosphorescent materials. Okay, so again, this is a application, again, glow in the dark, uh, toys, clothes, pajamas, clocks, dial, dials and clocks, watches. Again, that's, those are applications of quantum mechanics. Those are applications of atomic excitations and de-excitation. All right, next topic I'd like to talk about is the laser. All right, and so now lasers seem commonplace uh, to us, but let me just kind of I'm gonna I'm gonna go and uh, again as I as I said last time, um, right when COVID struck, uh, you know I was. I was about to start chapter 27 of our book. I mean, again, I, I was teaching physics too last spring. And so one of the things I did was to, uh, was to try out uh, doing PowerPoint presentations, right? And so, so again, I, I did a PowerPoint presentation uh, for this chapter and uh, I'm just re reutilizing that since, since again, this chapter has, uh, has very high, uh, uh, content, um, very very dense content. There's a lot of stuff in this chapter, so I'm gonna sh I'm gonna share my screen, and we're going to uh, start discussing lasers. All right, and so again, uh, the zoom tends to slow everything down. All right, share my screen now. And here's my PowerPoint. Okay, and you'll see my PowerPoint. I'm going to uh, now uh, put it in slideshow mode. Again, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Here we go. <laughs> All right, current slide. All right, here we are. So lasers seem to be everywhere today. I mean, they're, they seem commonplace. And, you know, we see them, we see them at stores. Uh, they're used to, uh, you know, they're used to read uh, barcode readers. Uh, we use them in libraries. We've seen, it, we've seen them in entertainment and laser shows. You know, we see them in, uh, we, we have laser printers make high quality printouts. We use lasers to send messages, prodigious number of messages through optical fibers. Lasers are used in surveying. They're used in weapon guidance systems, tumor eradication, optical welding of detached retinas, 
and they're used for reading CDs and DVDs. Now the question is, why do lasers have so many applications? What you know, why why is it that they are they are so useful? Well, generally lasers they produce single wavelength electromagnetic radiation that is also very coherent. That is, that the emitted photons are in phase and they can actually interfere with one another. Coherent wavelengths, coherent light is light that can interfere. So hence laser output can be more precisely manipulated than incoherent mixed wavelength electromagnetic radiation from other sources. So again, the reason why laser output is so pure and coherent is based on how it is produced. Well, we will discuss how you produce lasers and it, and it involves a metastable state and the lazy, what's called the lasing material, all right? So again, this is another application of atomic excitation, another applications of energy levels. Okay, so in the 1940s, and again, in the early 1960s, quantum physics made two enormous contributions to technology, the transistor and the laser. So the transistor, you know, simulated growth of what's called microelectronics. And that deals with interactions, at least at the quantum level, between electrons and bulk matter. The laser, on the other hand, is leading the way to a field now, that's now called photonics. And that deals with the interaction at the quantum level, again, between photons and bulk matter. And microelectronics is interaction between electrons and bulk matter. Photonics is interaction between photons and bulk matter. Now, so what makes uh, laser light uh, so special? Now, first of all, I didn't write this down, but let me uh, let me transition to my whiteboard for a moment. Um, I'm going back to my whiteboard. Um, one of the things I, I, I didn't write this in my, in my presentation on my PowerPoint, but one of the things is that laser light is monochromatic. Mono meaning one, chrome meaning color. The laser light is monochromatic. All right, so that, so essentially that means light from selected lines in the gas discharge tube, for instance, can have wavelengths in the visible region that are precise to about one part in 10 to the six. So tell you what I mean by this. So lights uh, from selected lines in the gas discharge tube, you know, the line spectrum we talked about. The light from selected lines in a gas discharge tube um, can have wavelengths in the visible region Um, that are precise to about one part in a million or in about 10 to the six. One part in a million. Okay. Uh, Lasers, the sharpness of a definition of laser light can be many times greater, about one part in say 10 to the 15. So the sharpness of definition of laser light and be much greater to 
to about one part in about in 10 to the 15 orders of magnitude better. So when we say that laser is monochromatic, I mean, we mean that laser is indeed precisely, highly precisely monochromatic. Okay, let me go back to my uh, PowerPoint. Share my screen again. Oh, I didn't put the monochromatic nature of lasers in there, but that's okay. So highly monochromatic, and we're talking about the properties of lasers. All right. Uh, sure I did that right. Yeah. That's it. All right. Make sure I'm showing you the right thing. Okay. And I'm going to. Okay. So, um, so laser light again, it says highly monochromatic. Laser light is highly coherent. Again, what I mean by coherent is it has the ability, two different uh, laser lights have the ability to interfere. All right, so they come from the same source, they can interfere, they're highly coherent. So wave trains of laser light can be several hundred kilometers long. That means that you can have interference fringes that are set up by combining two separate beams whose path lengths differ by such distances. You can have two lasers that whose path lengths differ by hundreds of kilometers and they'll still interfere. The corresponding coherence length, for instance, of any other light like tungsten filament, for instance, or a gas discharge is, on, is less than a meter, is typically less than a meter. You have lasers that can interfere up to, they have coherence lengths of up to kilometers. Gas discharge light and light from say a tungsten filament can only interfere they can only interfere to about up to about a meter at most. All right. Um, another great property: laser light is highly directional. So laser light only departs from parallelism only because of diffraction, and that's again that we recall the Rayleigh criterion. You can't beat the Rayleigh criterion. Theta sub r is 1.22 lambda over d, and that's from chapter 27. <laughs> so again, that's the only thing that defeats a laser. So light from any other sources can be made approximately parallel by a lens or a mirror, but their beam divergence is much greater than that for a laser. The only thing that causes a laser to diverge from pure parallelism is diffraction. And that's a Rayleigh criterion. Theta sub r is 1.22 lambda over d. Okay, laser light can be sharply focused, another great property. Again, this property is related to the parallelism that we just talked about. For laser light, the size of the focus spot is limited only by diffraction and not by the size of the source. Again, talked about that a moment ago. Energy flux densities for laser light can be on the order of 10 to the 16 watts per centimeter squared. And on the other hand, an oxidiline uh, flame can have an energy flux of about 10 to the third or a thousand watts per, meters, watts per centimeter squared. So we think of as oxyacetylene flames, you know, like in a, like in a, like the welders use as being highly, um, as, as having very high intensity. And yet it's nothing compared with a laser. A laser is on the order of 10 to the 16th watts per centimeter squared, where an oxyacetylene flame is only on the order of 10 to the third watts per centimeter squared. So lasers are also, um, they also vary, greatly vary in size. So your smallest lasers that are used in telephone communications of optical fibers have as their active medium a semiconducting gallium arsenide crystal about the size of a pinhead. So again, uh, about the size of a pinhead, uh, you can have um, gallium arsenide crystals. Smallest lasers possible. The largest lasers used for laser fusion research for military or and for military applications can fill up a large building. They can generate pulses. So get this: they can generate pulses of laser light of three times ten to the negative nine seconds, so three nanosecond duration, with a power level during the pulse of about eight 
times 10 to the 13th watts. That's more than 100 times the total electric power generating capacity of the United States. That's how big lasers can be. They can be very, very small, like the size of a pinhead, or they can take up an entire building like in these giant military grade lasers. Uh, other uses of lasers include spot welding detached retinas, drilling tiny holes in diamonds for drawing fine wire, cutting cloth 50 layers at a time with no frayed edges in the garment industry, precision surveying, precision length measurements by interferometry, generation of holograms, et cetera, et cetera. There are many applications of lasers. So how does a laser work? So we go to the work of the great Albert Einstein again. The word laser comes from, it's, a, it's actually an acronym. Now, generally speaking, you probably ought to write the word laser in terms of all large letters since it is an acronym. So laser is an acronym for what's called light amplification through the stimulated emission of radiation. And every word in there is very important. The word stimulated. Emit, stimulated emission are probably the most important words in this, in this um, acronym. Stimulated emission is the key to the operation of a laser. Einstein introduced that concept back in 1917, but the world would not see its first laser until 1960. So unfortunately, Albert Einstein passed away in 1955, so he did not get an opportunity to see the um, um, fruition of his great idea, of one of his many great ideas, of course. So I have three processes laid out here. And again, I'm going back to my, my little uh, bi-level uh, diagram that I talked about earlier. So I, I've talked about the process of absorption. Okay, again, on, if you look at the top of the uh, pictures, there's one that says absorption. Initially, at the before and the after, and initially you see the, again, I drew this picture earlier tonight. You see the before, the electron, there's two energy levels, E1 and E2. They describe two energy levels in an atom. Uh, electromagnetic radiation is present. So again, electromagnetic radiation of a particular photon, again, it's the key that undoes the lock. There has to be, that energy has to be just equal to delta E, E2 minus E1. That photon is present, is absorbed in the atom. In the process, it's called absorption. And afterwards, the photon vanishes. And now the electron is in the excited energy level, E2. Now, as I, as I said, electron usually is only in an excited energy level for only about 10 to the negative eight seconds. So again, this takes us to the middle set of pictures, the one that, that's labeled spontaneous emission. In the left, in the before picture, now the electron is in, in its excited state. You do not need electromagnetic radiation at this point. So I put the word none there because no photon is necessary. The electron, through its own accord, will, over a period of time, or over a short period, short period of time, will um, uh, descend from the e, higher entry level E2 to lower entry level E1 and give off a photon of just the right energy equal to delta E, E2 minus E1. And that, that delta E is equal to HF. That, that photon has an energy exactly equal to the, ener the change in energy levels of, those, of, of that atom from E2 to E1. But now the lowest picture you see Einstein's idea, and that is stimulated emission. This is so um, important for a laser. Now you look at you look at the picture. It looks like the middle picture, except now there is a photon of just the right energy present. All right. So the atom is in an excited state already, in energy level E two. Now you have a photon that comes around that has just the right energy again between E1 and E2. Again, the key the, um, the, the, uh, you know, for the lock. Now what happens? The electron, the electron is stimulated. It, it descends down from E2 to E1 and, what, and, and, and it gives off two absolutely identical photons. 
same energy, same parity, same angular momentum, everything. They're identical. This is the operation of the laser. Now, if you can imagine having a chain reaction of these, if you can somehow imagine getting a number of these electrons ready to, to descend, you can have a chain reaction that's just waiting around for the right photon, right? So again, this is Einstein's idea. So again, let's, let's uh, recap what I just said. So in, in the absorption process, um, what happens is that, again, the you have um, electron that's in a lower energy level E1, and we assume a continuous spectrum radiation is present, a photon of just right energy. HF equals the E2 minus E1 interacts with the atom, the photon will vanish, and the atom will move to its upper energy state. We call that process, again, absorption. Spontaneous emission, while well, as shown in the middle figures I showed, the atom is already in its upper energy state with no radiation present. We don't need radiation. Again, no radiation is present. At a certain time, tau, small time, uh, the atom moves on its own accord to the state of lower energy, emitting a photon of energy HF in the process. Again, HF meaning that exact photon energy equal to the difference of the two energy levels. That is called spontaneous emission. We don't know when it's gonna happen. It's, it's, again, it's based upon probability. Usually the mean life of an excited state, again, as I said, it was about 10 to the negative eight seconds. There are some states that are, I said, are, are called metastable. Their lifetimes can be much longer, like 10 to the negative three seconds. So simulated emissions, again, the bottom figure is, now that we start off, again, the electron already is in, it, in its excited state, E2. We assume that a continuous spectrum radiation is now present. That right photon comes around. It has a frequency whose energy HF is just equal to E2 minus E1. Interacts with that atom. The result, the electron moves to a lower energy state. And now two identical photons are emitted with what is called spontaneous emission. And again, you can see how a chain reaction could be triggered by such stimulated emission event. Laser light, again, is produced by this kind of stimulated emission. Now, in the usual case, as I said, many photons are present. So given a large enough uh, number of atoms present at a certain temperature T, we ask, we ask the question, how many of them will be in a state with level E1? And how many in level E2? Okay, so again, imagine you have a whole bunch of atoms that have these two energy levels, E1 and E2. Okay, you have a whole bunch of these atoms. We're gonna do some statistics. They all have energy levels E1 and E2, just as stated, E1 is lower than E2. And we ask, there's plenty, a plentitude of electromagnetic radiation around. And we ask, how many of those, of those atoms given that there's a temperature T by just thermal agitation alone, thermal excitation alone, how many of them will be in, an, in the upper energy level? So let's just say, for instance, that we have an energy level E sub X, okay, an, an, an excited energy E sub X. We would like to know how many atoms, out of all the atoms present, how many of them will be in this excited energy level E sub X? And that's given by N sub X as C, E to the negative E sub X over KT. Now that's hard to read. So again, I that negative sign is hard to read. So let me go to my whiteboard briefly. Sorry about that. Uh, again, what that says is, I don't know what happened to the negative sign in the exponential, but I'm gonna just rewrite that equation really quickly. So get, that equation says, so if you have a, so again, there are, as I said, there are, consider many atoms with energy levels E1 and E2 Uh, E1 is less than E2 at temperature T.
how many? Well, actually, we'll say E1 and we'll say some other E sub X. How many of these atoms, N sub X, will be in the excited, excited state or an energy state E sub X, or energy state E sub X, we'll say. All right, Ludwig Boltzmann, the great Ludwig Boltzmann had the answer to this. So Ludwig Boltzmann from thermodynamics, from kinetic theory of gases, Boltzmann constant. So the Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann um, showed that the number n sub x of atoms And um, in any energy level, in, in a level whose energy is E sub X, is N sub X is equal to, okay? A constant C E to the negative E sub X over KT. Okay, E to the negative E sub X over KT. There's a negative sign that's hard to see in the in the slides. This tells us how many atoms of all the atoms that are that are present, how many of them will be in a state of energy E sub X. Again, K is Boltzmann's constant, all right? So this has to deal with, again, thermodynamics. This is thermal agitation, all right? So now let me go back and share my uh, PowerPoint again. Sure, my PowerPoint. Right. And this it's supposed to be a negative sign there. Hard to see. All right. So now we'll go and All right, so Nick, again, e to the, so again, n sub x is c e to the negative e sub x over kt. C is a constant. K is Boltzmann's constant. 1.38 times 10 negative 23 joules per Kelvin is Boltzmann's constant. Now, it seems reasonable since, you know, the quantity kt, again, is the mean energy of agitation of atoms at a temperature t. Again, we learned that in kinetic theory gases. When we see the higher the temperature, the more atoms on long-term average will be bumped up to the thermal agitation. But we apply the above equation to two levels, E1 and E2, and divide, we, and, and divide the two, the, the constant C will just cancel out. So then that's why we don't really need to know what C is. We find the ratio of the number of atoms at the upper level to those in the lower level. Again, you can do the math here. You take N2 over N1. Again, E2, again, is great. E2, E2 is um, energy, that's greater than E1. So it'll be C E to the negative E2 over KT uh, over C E to the neg uh, negative E1 over KT. And again, let me, give me a moment here. Let me fix this up. Sorry about this. I don't know what happened. I'll fix it up so it's 
readable. Microsoft's trying to help me out here or what? All right. Do this again. I'll save this before I right. exit tonight. So again, N2 over N1 is C E to the negative E2 over KT over C E to the negative E1 over KT. So you did the math. Again, the C's cancel out. That's why I don't really need to know what they are. And then you just, you just basically multiply the top and bottom by E to the positive E1 over KT. That gets rid of everything on the bottom. And um, so there's no more denominator. And then, and then what happens is you should combine the exponents on top and you end up getting that e to, N2 over N1 is E to the negative quantity E2 minus E1 all over KT. Again, the E2 minus E1 over KT is all in the argument of the exponential, right? So E to the, so the negative quantity E2 minus E1 over KT is entirely in the argument of the exponential. Now, since E2 is greater than E1, that ratio N2 over N1 will always be less than one. That means there will always be fewer atoms in the upper energy level than in the lower energy level. And that's what we expect. So even if we flood the atoms with photons, in, in the long run, more will be absorbed than generated. All right, and so, you know, again, in long-term average. So for laser for laser work, we can we we must generate photons, not absorb them. So we must have some. We must find a clever way to find a way to we can have more uh, electrons in the upper energy level than in the lower energy level. We need a what's called a population inversion, where there are more atoms with electrons in the upper energy level than in the lower energy level. A population inversion. So that is what we need for a laser. And so the very first ever laser uh, was again in 1960. Uh, it was uh, produced by Theodore Maiman. Now Theodore Maiman uh, produced what was called the optically pumped laser. So you start off with a lasing material. So again, all the, the lasing material, lasing material is called ruby. It's ruby. So uh, it's called a ruby laser. So we start with essentially all the atoms. All the atoms are have their energy in the ground state E1. Now you supply energy to the system. Um, you know, basically accomplished through a, a very large amount of electromagnetic radiation, and so you promote a lot of the atoms so that their electrons are, are in an excited state E3. Okay, now E3 is short-lived. E2 in a diagram is a metastable state. So it's accomplished through what's called optical pumping where energy comes from an intense continuous spectrum of light, light source that surrounds lasing material. So, so again, you, you surround the lasing material. There's many, there's many atoms there that are they have these energy levels, but you know, again, this is the atoms and what will be what was it was uh, called ruby, crystalline ruby. Uh, the very uh, intense continuous electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation will optically pump or excite many of the atoms such that their electrons go to a, a short lived state E3. Now, again, E3 is short lived, so those, so those electrons will then many of them will descend to the state E2. E2 is the metastable state. So you give enough energy, you, you pick um, the electromagnetic uh, radiation such that you want E3 minus E1. You want, the, you want the photons to be in energy level E3 minus E1. So you pump the electrons into the state E3. Now E3 is a short-lived state. And a lot of the electrons are going to descend into state E2. E2 is metastable. That means that the process to go from E2 down to E1 is going to take a long time. And for that to happen, you get, you get this, um, again, the metastable state has a lifetime much longer than your typical lifetime. And so what you end up getting is the population inversion that you want. All right, and so again, we, we, we've achieved the necessary, again, I'm on the top of this slide, we've achieved the necessary population inversion where N2 is greater than N1. So all you need now, all you need now is one stray photon, 
with just the right energy, HF equal to E2 minus E1, that will trigger an avalanche of stimulated emission events from the say E2 into E1 and create laser light. So again, you have the population inversion and all it takes is just the right photon to come by that has the energy E2 minus E1 and that, and that will actually induce an avalanche of photons, identical photons in every way. That is how a laser works. We achieve population inversion utilizing metastable state. So again, uh, in the optically pumped laser, highly, in, highly intense light uh, uh, is, I mean, the, the, your, your uh, lasing material, crystalline ruby is bathed in highly intense light such that the frequency of the photons have an energy of E3 minus E1. We want to pump the lasers above the metastable state. We want to pump them to a short-lived state E3. They don't live in E3 very long, but you live in E3 for about 10 to negative eight seconds. And they quickly descend and sit in E2, the metastable state. And they, and, and they, and they collect in E3. And they wait around for just that right, laser, that right photon to show up that has the energy E2 minus E1 to induce the simulated emission events. And there'll be an avalanche of photons that are identical to that photon, that's, that straight photon that came by to, to generate that, to induce that avalanche. That's laser light. And that's the optically pumped crystalline ruby laser created by Theodore Maiman in 1960. Now, typically, when you go to a physics lab, you'll see the uh, helium neon laser. Typically, it's nice. Your, you know, their your popular orange red uh, laser light that comes out. And again, it 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 also uh, deals with the same kind of um, process that has to have a lasing process, but it's different, a little bit more complicated. You look at this laser, and I try to do the best I can. Um, there's a laser discharge tube. All right, and so on either side, so the tube is connected by, by a, a high voltage source. Now, you'll see on either side of the tube, um, in the tube, you know, it's, it's gonna be uh, helium neon. Now on either side, let's kind of look at this mo um, for a moment. M1 and M2 are a couple of mirrors whose focal lengths uh, coincide right about the center of the tube. W, the on each side are, windows that are at an angle, it's called the Brewster angle. We talked about the Brewster angle earlier. It's an angle such that you, you have, um, you, um, if you have it just right, you get no reflections of electromagnetic radiation in, in, in a particular direction. It'll be the reflections um, in a particular polarization. So you set these Brewster windows, you reduce the possibility of loss by reflection. So the idea is you're, you're gonna want to, so the idea is that that gas discharge tube is filled with 80%, 20% mixture of the noble gases, helium and neon. Neon is the lacing material. So you take a look, I, I, I wrote next to each other the two uh, energy level diagrams for helium and neon. And you see that neon, I said helium states are, you know, are shown on the left. Now, helium has, there's a state E0, which is the, uh, the very, uh, the ground state. E3 is a metastable state in helium. All right, now E3, it turns out that, um, that E3 has an energy of about, again, this, the, it's metastable, has energy of about 20.61 electron volts. Now, neon's energy levels are shown to the right. They're, they have, they have energies, you know, E zero, E one, and E two. Turns out that just by happenstance, E three is very close to E two. So E three has an energy of about twenty point six one electron volts. And I, I state these energies on the next slide. E two has an energy of twenty point six six electron volts. And so what happens is the unstable helium. Uh, 
the, I'm sorry, the metastable helium atom um, and a given ground uh, and a given ground state neon will collide. And the excitation energy of the helium atom can then be transferred to the neon atom. In this way, uh, level E2 the, in the helium neon figure can be uh, can become more heavily populated with level uh, than level E1 in that figure. So again, uh, the, the the electron beam in a gas discharge tube excites the he the helium atoms. So again, it's it's more helium than there is neon. These helium atoms get excited to a metastable state E3 because of the current that's going through the, the discharge. Now, the helium will collide with the neon. Now, the helium has, again, as I say here, the helium E3 is about 20.61 electron volts. So again, so how it works, so again, the top of all the electrons and ions in the discharge frequently enough collide with the helium as raising them to a level E3. This level is metastable, so the spontaneous emission from ground state E0 occurs very slowly. So again, the, there's more helium than neon. The, the electrons in the gas discharge, uh, will, discharge in the gas discharge tube will collide and and um, by collisions they'll promote the um, they'll excite the uh, helium atoms to the energy state e3 energy state e3 is metastable okay now the helium atoms will then uh, so, so given that they're metastable they're going to stay the helium atoms will stay in state E3 and not go back to E0. Okay, now, or, or, or very slowly. Now E3, it turns out, has, a, has an energy of about 20.61 electron volts, and E2 in neon has an energy of 20.66 electron volts. So when a metastable helium atom and a ground state neon atom collide, the excitation energy of the helium atom can be transferred to the neon atom. And that way the populate the energy level E2 in helium neon figure can be more populated in E1. This population inversion is maintained because one, the metastability of E3 ensures a ready supply of neon atoms at level E2, and two, atoms at level E1 decay rapidly through the intermediate stations not shown to the helium ground state E0. So Simulated emission that we see that red that special uh, red uh, laser light is the emission between E2 and E1. That's what predominates. And so again, going back to that figure, re, let's recap. There's four energy levels involved here. So there's more helium. There's eighty percent helium, twenty percent neon. So the the gas the, so the electron electron beam is going to collide with the helium atoms and promote them to the metastable state E3. Now, excited helium goes around and it, and it collides with, again, it, it's E3 is 20.61 electron volts. It collides with a neon atom. It's in its ground state. It promotes, it, it, and so that it transfers its energy. So the neon is now excited. Now E2 is not metastable, but it'll be it, but it will maintain a population inversion because of all the collisions from the from the neon. The neon is is has a ready supply of of, uh, of electrons in the energy on the high energy level. Now once it goes, once it transfers energy to the neon atom, the neon will then will then um, rapidly um, the electron in the high energy level of neon will rapidly uh, descend to E1. And the laser light that we see. Is the light is the is the light that corresponds to the energy difference E two minus E one. That's what happens. So it's a more complicated process. Again, electron beam excites helium. There's more helium than there is neon uh, by about a factor of four. Helium gets excited until into a state E three. So again, electrons will stay in the helium uh, E three. Now that electron then is the helium atom is then excited bumps into a neon atom that's in its ground state, transfers its energy because the energy E2 is very close to E3, transfers its energy to the, to the ground state neon, exciting it to E2. 
E2 is not metastable. So the electrons in E2 will quickly descend to E1 and we have laser light. And again, that laser light is maintained for two reasons, as I stated in uh, the third bullet here. One, the metastability of E3 ensures a ready supply of neon atoms in level E2. And two, atoms in the level E1, they'll decay rapidly through intermediate stages that are not shown to E0. All right, so they, then the neon ends up going back to its ground state after it emits its red photon between E2 and E1. So simulated emission from E2 to E1 predominates and red laser light of wavelength 632.8 nanometers is generated. But that's not enough though. We have the ability to generate the laser light, but how do we get the parallel laser light that we're used to? All right, and so again, so most stimulated emission photons will initially be produced in a gas discharge will not happen to be parallel to the tube axis. They'll be, they'll be randomly uh, oriented. But the ones that are not parallel be, will be stopped at the tube walls and they'll just, they'll just get absorbed. So the ones that are parallel, uh, they get to produce more parallel photons because they, get, they, they essentially will be bounced back and forth between beams M1 and M2 rapidly. And they build up a chain reaction of these parallel, nicely parallel photons. So mirrors M1 and M2 are concave, as I showed you in the picture. Their focal points nearly coincide at the center of the tube. Mirror M1 is coated with a dielectric film whose thickness is carefully chosen such that it becomes a near perfect reflector. But M2 is coated to be slightly leaky. So the small fraction of that laser light can escape at each reflection to form a useful beam. So you can, and then the windows W that close the ends of the discharge tube are slanted at the Brewster angle theta sub e to minimize the loss of light by reflection. And that was a capital W. Correct that real quick. All right. So, did I do that? All right, maybe I don't did. Anyway, okay, so the windows um, are, are um, at the Brewster angle. So they, so they reduce the um, possibility of, uh, of there being reflection at the discharge tube. All right, I don't know what's going on here. This thing is acting crazy. All right, there we are. All right, so that was very slow. So let's, uh, let's continue. It must be Zoom slowing things down. All right, so again, the, Initial photons are not going to be oriented parallel. They will be a, they will be spontaneously oriented. However, the ones that are not parallel will be will uh, collide with the tube axis and be and be stopped. They'll be uh, absorbed by the by the I'm sorry by the by the tube walls. They'll be absorbed by the tube walls. But the ones that are parallel, they will be they will bounce and back and forth by those by successive reflections due to mirrors M1 and M2. And you get a chain reaction that builds up because you keep having these same parallel photons um, going back and forth and they'll just create more parallel photons. Mirrors M1 and M2 are concave at the endpoints of the, of, the, of the tube and their focal points nearly coincide at the center of the tube. M1 is coated with a dielectric film whose thickness is carefully chosen to make the mirror as close to possible as a perfect reflector at that wavelength of the laser light. And mirror M2 is coded to be slightly leaky, so the small fraction of the laser light can escape at each reflection to form a useful beam. So again, that's the beam that we see, the laser light that, the, that is allowed to leak at mirror M2. And the windows at the end where you see these reflections, they're coded, they are slanted at the Brewster angle to minimize the loss of light by reflection. All right, and so uh, that is, um, that's the end of that PowerPoint on lasers. Again, that is the concept of lasers. And I'm gonna, I think that's it for my PowerPoint there. All right, so that's the concept of lasers. Now, the, um, now that's, uh, so let's kind of do some problems on lasers now. I'm gonna look at, uh, OpenStack, uh, OpenStack's 30.30. Um, and we'll 
kind of do some problems here where we, we involve the concept of laser. All right, so open stacks, uh, 30.30. Okay, so I'll draw the figure. Figure open stacks, so figure 30.39, I'll, I'll reproduce in a moment. Uh, figure 30, 30.39 shows <clears throat> uh, the energy level diagram for neon. Okay, um, A, I'll, I'll, I'll reproduce this. A, verify the energy of the photon emitted. Um, from the its metastable state. <clears throat> to the one immediately below. Um, it, I'm sorry, is equal to 1.96 electron volts. That's part A. Part B, show the wavelength for, of this radiation is 633 nanometers. C, um, what wavelength is emitted when the neon makes a direct transition to, to its ground state? So none of this is gonna make any sense until I show you the, show you the figure. What wavelength is emitted when the uh, neon makes a direct transition to its ground state. Yeah. All right, read it again. Problems are fairly wordy. Okay, so here we go. Opus X 30.30. Figure 30.39 shows the energy level diagram for neon. A, verify that the energy of the photon emitted from its metastable state to the one immediately below is equal to 1.96 electron volts. B, show that the wavelength of this radiation, the 1.96 electron volt difference, is 633 nanometers. C, what wavelength is emitted when the neon makes a direct transition to its ground state? Okay, so again, let's let me uh, when I erase the erase this and let me reproduce the figure here, and uh, that way it makes a lot more sense. All right, so I'll reproduce figure thirty point thirty nine from OpenStax. All right, so. 
Figure 30.39 looks like this. So they draw it like this. This, this is for ground state and this is helium. Uh, ground state. Helium is the left left picture. I mean, you don't see the right picture yet. So we're looking at helium. Uh, this is the first excited state. All right, and then the difference here is 20.61 electron volt. Again, as I quoted in the, in the slides. Then you have metastable neon. Okay, and here is a state, and here is ground state again, and this is neon, according to the diagram. This is 20.66 electron volts. And this is your 1.96. Electron volt. All right. Now, this difference right here is 18.70 electron volt. All right. So, to answer the question, the answer to part A, for part A, um, the energy difference. Oh, I answered it. Uh, the first excited state of neon um, and ground state and ground state of eighteen point seven zero electron volts. That difference is 18.70. Um, is neither quoted in this problem or in the chapter. So then I looked it up. That 18.70 I looked up. So it's neither quoted in this in the problem. or in this chapter. Okay, so, <clears throat> but it can be looked up. And that's how I, don't, I did the problem. Okay, um, so, so thus, to prove it, now that I looked it up, 20.66 electron volts to go from the ground state to the metastable state in, in neon, minus the energy between the ground state and this, uh, and this uh, first excited state, 18.70 electron volts, is indeed 1.96 electron volts as, as stated. So there you go. So that checks out. Eight, not 1.96 electron volts is the difference between a metastable state and the excited state, that difference where you emit late, the red, the characteristic red laser light. Let's prove that that is red. Let's, let's prove that is the famous uh, 632 nanometers. Now we know it's 1.96 electron volts. That's a part A. Now the question is, does that correspond to the wavelength that we're used to for the red, la the red laser light that comes out of a helium neon laser? All right, so let's look at part B. Uh, 
Okay, so, so we know it's 1.96 electron volts. So delta E in these energy levels is 1.96 electron volts. Now, of course, I, have to, I need to put that into joules in order to make this, in order to be able to do this problem. So delta E, 1.96 electron volts. And we know there are 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules in an electron volt. So that corresponding energy difference uh, becomes 3.136 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. All right. Now we want to get this. We know this is a that there's going to be an, a photon given off. Photons are always given off such that their energy is equal to the energy difference between the energy levels. All right, and it's given off by characteristic frequency. So again, you can write this as, well, this delta E, the, the photon given off, the laser light, is HF. But we know that C equals lambda F, so I can always write this as HC over lambda. The speed of light is C, and lambda is a wavelength. Well, let's solve for lambda. What is that laser light that we're talking about? What is that wavelength? Well, we're gonna switch partners here and this lambda simply becomes HC over delta E. It's working out. Lambda, Planck's constant is 6.626 .6 times 10 to the negative 34 joules second. That's Planck's constant. Speed of light, I'm gonna to try to be a little bit more precise. 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second divided by that energy difference. And that's gonna be 3.136 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And when I do all that calculation, I get that, I get the famous, uh, what comes out of this, let me write it up here. When I do this calculation, I get that lambda is equal to 6.33 times 10 to the negative seven meters, or lambda is 633 nanometers. That's that famous red light that comes out of a helium neon laser. It is because of this energy difference between a metastable uh, energy level and the first excited state of neon. And helium uh, energy levels, neon energy levels. Again, this is your picture. Again, two, uh, two um, um, types of atoms are involved here, as I mentioned earlier. Now, the last part of this, part C says, what, happened, what kind of wavelength would you get if you just literally did a transition, you know, instead of going instead of going to the first study, say what happens if you actually what happens what happens if the electron actually fell all the way back to the ground state? What what photon would be given off now? All right, so again, that's part C. That that photon would not produce laser light, but most of them are going to get populated in that first exciting state. So part C, want to find out what happens if an electron makes a transition from the highest or that highest energy level, a metastable state down to the ground state, straight back down to the ground state without stopping at, the, at, that, at that state that's 1.96 uh, electron volts below. So again, the question I wanna ask is, well, again, using the same math, I again get lambda is HC over delta E, but now my delta E is different. My delta E now is considering electron dropping from the metastable state all the way down to the ground state in neon. So what happens now? Well, that's that's 20.66 electron volts, right? So we just simply say, well, okay, lambda, Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds times the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Again, divided by this larger energy difference, 20.66 electron volts. And then I have to convert that, of course, to SI. 
So again, 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per electron. And here we go. And this, this wavelength now becomes 6.01 times 10 to the negative eight meters, which would be 60.1 nanometers. So that's in the ultraviolet. And that's pretty deep in the ultraviolet given that the violet, you know, is the end of the, uh, is the smallest wavelength uh, visible photon and it's 380 nanometers. This is quite a bit smaller than your basic visible photon or your lowest visible photon. All right, so another problem on lasers, Opus X 30.34. Thirty thirty four. All right, open set. Thirty point thirty four. All right. Uh, some of the most powerful lasers some of the most powerful lasers. Um, are based on the energy levels of neodymium in solids. such as glass. Um, as shown in figure 30.65, so I'll reproduce that figure too. And it's from OpenStack. A, what is the, what average wavelength light? What average wavelength light can pump the neodymium into the levels above its metastable state? B, verify that the 1.1 submicron volt transition produces 1.06 micrometer radiation. This is a famous uh, wavelength, by the way, in industry. So verify that the 1.17 electron volts transition produces 1.06 micrometer radiation. All right, so some of the most powerful lasers are based on the energy levels of neodymium in solids, such as glass is shown in figure 30.65. A, what average wavelength light can pump the neodymium into levels above its metastable state? 
and B, verify that the 1.17 electron volt transition produces 1.06 micrometer radiation. All right, so again, I need to draw a uh, diagram for you. So I'll kind of remember this. So work through this. So I have to reproduce a diagram for you. I'm gonna erase this. I'll kind of remind you of what, what, what I am uh, solving as I go along. Part A. All right, so let's see here. I have 2.1 electron volt, call that the group. And then we have a metastable second. And that's it. This is 2.1 electron volts. The metastable second is at 1.67 electron volts. That's the metastable state. Okay. Um, the first excited state is, is at 0 0.5 electron volts. And then the ground state, it's zero. All right, so there's my diagram. Now, um, so first thing I wanna verify is I said, okay, A, what average wavelength light can pump the neodymium to levels above its metastable state? So again, what you wanna do is you wanna pump the, the electrons in the material to a state that's above the metastable. And then those electrons will live very briefly there and they'll populate in the metastable state. I mean, that's the whole point. They stay, the electrons will, will, will go down and populate in the metastable state and sit there and wait long for that right photon to show up, right? And so we want to find out well, what, what, um, what kind of light will take an atom and pump its electron from the, you know, into the upper state such that it can descend and sit in a metastable state, all right? So again, we want to look at, well, what, uh, what wavelength of light corresponds to an energy difference from zero to 2.1. Again, remember, photons of just the right frequency have to, ha have to be absorbed to, to, to uh, promote an electron from one energy level to another. We want to, have the, we want to choose the right frequency to promote electrons in the ground state to this group state, as it's called. So, Delta E would have to be what? It'd have to be, I want to go to 2.1 minus zero, right? That's where I'm starting. So I'll go, that's of course 2.1 electron volt, all right? So what ener what, what's the, that energy in joules? Well, Delta E would then be 2.1 electron volts. And there's 1 1.602, 1.60, 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per electron volt. And that gives me the value in joules conversion. 3.36 <clears throat> times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And of course, the I need I'm trying to find the right photon to create this transition. So again, that photon is gonna have the energy equal to this. So, so that photon is gonna be given as delta E has to match up to HF or HC over lambda. We've seen this before, I wanna solve for lambda. So lambda switch partners here is HC over delta E. which again is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules second times the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. 
divided by the energy energy difference, which is 3.36 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And that lam that uh, lambda is equal to um, 5.91. times 10 to the negative seven meters or 591 nanometers. 591 nanometers. All right, so again, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what is the right amount of light to pump. You know, I have this neodymium, I wanna pump the electrons and in, in the, in the material, I wanna pump the electron uh, each in each neodymium atom from its ground state to this group state, which is above them at a stable second. And then, of course, that state's going to then tran uh, transition by, sp spon uh, by spontaneous emission into the metastable state and give off the, the laser light, right? And so the energy for me to do that has got to be 2.1 electron volts minus zero. I get that energy converted into joules. And I guess I know the photon needed to do this has to match the energy difference. So again, delta E is going to be HF. That, that's the energy of the photon necessary. Again, HF is the same as H over lambda. So I can solve for lambda. Lambda is H over delta E. Again, we've done this. Uh, uh, we've done similar problems already. All right. Now, the second question is, we'll verify that this 1.17 uh, electron volts gives you a 1.06 micrometer um, radiation. Again, this is this is a famous uh, uh, frequency for lasers, 1.06 micrometers, all right? So let's verify that that's the case. So I um, want to get the laser light now. So again, we want to look at this transition from the this group state to the metastable second. So delta E again is 1.17 electron volts now. And again, I need to tra trans, for me to be able to do this problem, I need to put it into joules, which is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per electron volts. And that gives me an energy of 1.87. Times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Now the question is, does that correspond to the 1.06 micrometer wavelength? Let's find out. So again, the right photon that you're going to see coming out when it, when you do this transition, again, when the electron goes from this group level to the metastable second, a photon is going to be emitted, right? And so that photon being emitted is going to be given off by a special frequency, a special energy HF, or again HC over lambda. And again, I want to solve for lambda. So again, we just did this in part A. Lambda is HC over delta E or 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. That's Planck's constant times the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and that's divided by uh, delta E, which is going to be this energy difference from the group to the metastable second, or 1.87 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. When I work this out, I find out that lambda is equal to 1.06 times 10 to the negative six meters, which of course equals 1.06 micrometers as advertised. So yes, that is the wavelength of the light that's given off when light go, when electrons transition from that group state to the metastable second. Okay, so now we transition into True full-blown quantum mechanics. 
All right. And, and so um, this is where, again, this is where, uh, you know, because of the, the Broly hypothesis, uh, we may, we all of a sudden uh, were able to understand that what we thought were particles are actually waves. And in fact, uh, every, every particle had a, had a matter wave and the wave, you know, they, they, they obeyed a wave equation and we call it the Schrodinger equation. All right. And so again, the true quantum mechanics, the true wave nature of matter allowed us to develop the true quantum mechanics that was, you know, done by Erwin Schrodinger for the non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And a couple of years later, I think that's 1926 for Schrodinger. A couple of years later uh, was the Dirac quantum mechanics. So essentially in quantum mechanics, um, okay, let me go back to my notes here. Um, you want to, So again, we're, we're going to talk about true quantum mechanics. All right. Now, quantum mechanics. You know. So once, um, um, Prince uh, Louis Victor de Broglie. hypothesized in his uh, PhD dissertation that all matter and photons obeyed lambda equals h over p and Davison and Germer as well as G.P. Thompson verified this fact with electron diffraction experiments quantum mechanics went into a very productive mode Quantum mechanics developed very quickly. The true quantum mechanics. This is the avalanche that uh, that was needed. This is the idea that was needed, critical idea. All right, and so recall in 1926, So in 1926, Erwin Schrodinger, the Austrian physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, developed the 
the true non-relativistic quantum mechanics Okay. Shortly thereafter, 1928, the great Paul Dirac, who, uh, who held the same position in Cambridge University as Isaac Newton, Paul Dirac uh, produced the correct relativistic quantum mechanics. He also predicted the existence of antimatter. So he also theoretically predicted the existence of antimatter. Okay, and so the idea, I mean, again, we're not going to talk about Dirac's relativistic theory. Of course, we're going to kind of more go into the non-relativistic Schrodinger quantum mechanics. And again, you know, there is a, the, the level of mathematical detail required to do this correctly is well beyond the scope of this class. So I'm going to try to do things in a notional way. But the idea with quantum mechanics, as I said earlier, You know, the fundamental equation of quantum mechanics. So the fundamental equation that must be solved for any quantum system is Schrodinger's equation called the Schrodinger equation. And I, show, I showed this in chapter 29. Again, it looks very foreign uh, to you, but again, I, I write it again. So again, I h bar, remember h bar is h over two pi. I'm gonna do this um, in a uh, special way here. So again, I h bar partial of psi. Now psi is typically in terms of coordinates. In this case, I mean, I wrote it last time as x, y, z, and t. But again, it's usually, you can think of it, in, 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 you know, there's spherical symmetry in an atom. It's usually do things as spherical polar coordinates. So R, theta, B, and T. Theta is a polar angle, B is the azimuthal angle. With respect to time, and that's equal to um, uh, negative H bar squared over 2M. del squared psi of r theta phi and then plus b of r potential psi of r theta phi. This is a partial differential equation, all right? And, I, and I've showed you this last time. So again, i is, is a complex value that's equal to square root of negative one is the imaginary number so it's an imat so there's a, it's a complex valued equation means it has a real part and imaginary part uh h over two pi happens so frequently in physics we just call this we call this h bar called h bar as you pronounce it 
is h over two pi h bar. You see this in your Microsoft Word, if you will. Now this, uh, this partial differential equation, again, and, and m is the electron mass. V of R is the potential function for the system. And it is what makes one Schrodinger different equation different from another. All right, the potential function. So again, most, as I said in chapter 29, uh, you will generally, uh, most Schrodinger equations cannot be solved. In fact, only a handful can actually be solved analytically. Most of that to be done with some sort of a computer model. All right, so most of the time you can't solve it. But the idea is um, you wanna solve the Schrodinger equation. This is a multi-dimensional equation. All right, and so essentially the idea is you want to solve the Schrodinger equations. So it's a partial differential equation, but you're going to apply what is called boundary condition. All right, so the idea is um, we desire to solve the Schrodinger equation. which is a partial differential equation. Whose solution is the matter wave function. Sine of R theta B in T. Okay, now the probability so, uh, sir, so the psi of R theta B in T is complex value, it means it has a real part and imaginary part. So again, psi of R, theta, B, and T is complex value. This is the wave function of the, of, the, of, the, of the particle. This is the matter wave function of the particle. Now, the thing is, it's complex value. So it's complex value, meaning that its values have a real part and an imaginary part with the imaginary number i equals square root of negative one. All right? You uh, get the probability distribution function. By getting by taking the complex square this is what makes it important of the wave function. So again, I talked about this at toward the end of chapter of the chapter twenty nine lecture. 
So again, your probability distribution function is taking the what's called the complex conjugate psi star and multiplying it by psi. And again, to get psi star, you again all you do is you change everywhere you see a comp uh, an imaginary term with i, you just change its sign. All right, and I, I showed you that last time. Now, um, the thing about it is. What you want to do is fit this wave function in a in a um, container. All right. So again, this wave function does not naturally want to be fit into a container. But in quantum mechanics, when when you have what's called a bound state, you're trying to fit something that's a wave function, but you're trying to you're trying to you're trying to basically put it into a into a box. You're trying to fit this wave into a container, all right? And so, again, a bound state system is one that has quantum states, quantum energies. Free particles do not, all right? And so, for a bound, for a bound system, for a bound electron, I mean, electron that's bound, bound meaning tied, for a bound electron, We need to fit the wave function in a container. Or a box. Right? So what this means is that we need to establish, we need to employ what are called boundary conditions. I.e., we need to set up nodes. at the container walls, if you will, such that the wave function becomes a standing wave. So recall for a standing wave, we had special resonances that ended up being integers. Or we had special relationships where, you know, if you had a wave, if you had a sound wave inside of a tube open at one end, you know, you know, you were able to show that, you know, that there was an integer relationship such that, you know, if n equals one, three, five, or one, two, three, whatever, the integers that, that these that these standing waves, the frequencies of the standing waves were dependent upon some fr basic frequency. And then there was an integer relationship that related one from the other. So there, so, so essentially solutions of standing waves. So standing waves standing waves um, have resonances. that differ from one another by integers. We saw this in, we saw this in uh, at the end of chapter uh, physics one. All right, so what this means in quantum mechanics, because again, the matter wave is again a wave, right? So in quantum mechanics, 
It turns out, so it turns out that the multidimensional wave function psi of r, the radial. Again, we're talking about spherical polar coordinates, right? So in spherical polar coordinates, I can locate something by knowing what its radius is. I can figure out what its latitude is, or, or if you are the polar angle from the North Pole, call that theta. And I can figure out how far around it is. We call that phi, angle phi. So I can locate the particle exactly by knowing its radio, its polar angle, and its azimuth angle, right? And then the time. So again, we're talking about, we're talking about spherical polar coordinates. We're using, you know, again, because atoms have a spherical symmetry. We typically want to use spherical polar coordinates with atoms, all right? So when I say this, I have psi of r, theta, phi, and t. Now, what, what a very nice property of, of this is that I can write this as what's called a, 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 a product. Um, so, so again, um, Multidimensional wave function psi of r, theta, phi, and t can be written as a product of one dimensional function. Not every, not every, um, not every function, multivariable function has this property. It's very special. So you could say that psi of r, theta, phi, and t, we'll just kind of use letters. I could say, well, it's, it's some function of just r multiplied by another function I'll call capital theta of little theta, of theta, the, the, the um, polar angle. And I'll say, well, it's, it's also another function, capital phi of little phi, and maybe a, a function t of little t. And so each one of these functions has to have some sort of, 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 of um, standing wave property. So each, each component function Must uh, exhibit standing wave. Uh, must exhibit standing wave behavior with respect to special energies. Which we call quantum numbers. So I'm gonna. You know, so the quantum numbers apply to the spatial variables, so r, theta, and phi. So, for instance, the special quantum number. So again, each one of these has a special quantum number. Again, special integers that deal with the whole process of, of having to enforce um, a bound state condition, all right? So the quantum number that deals with the radio is the principal quantum number, it turns out. So the quantum number that's associated with the radio function, R of R. It's associated with quantum numbers of principal, quantum number, and I'll get physical meanings to these in a moment. And 
The one dealing with theta, cap theta, theta, is the orbital angular momentum. Quantum number. Which we give by lowercase l. I was just writing the script form, so it doesn't look like a one. And the one for the azimuthal function oops, sorry, B of V, that corresponds to what's called the uh, angular momentum. projection quantum number M sub L. All right, so again, we have special integers that come up in quantum mechanics and you know, it's not by magic. And again, we'll talk about the Pauli exclusion principle where every electron has an address given by a set of quantum numbers, right? What is quantum numbers come from the solution to the Schrodinger equation? And each one of these one dimensional functions has to be separately bound to a, to a, a region by what are called, by basically to, to make what are called standing waves. And the standing waves are special integers. The radial standing wave has a corresponding special integer associated with it that describes its uh, allowed modes. And that's a principal quantum number n. We've already seen that with the, with the Bohr theory. Uh, the orbital angular momentum quantum, uh, quantum number is associated, uh, little l, we haven't talked about that yet, but that's associated with the polar uh, function. And the azimuthal function is associated with called the angular momentum projection quantum number m sub l. So, let's, so again, that's about as much of the mathematical details I'm going to give. I'm going to really kind of more or less draw up on pictures after this. So, so first of all, let's talk about um, the principal quantum number. Again, I'm going to kind of do this. I'm going to kind of specify this more of a kind of in pictures, if you will, to kind of give a better understanding. So this, this is the hardcore mathematics that we talk about. This is what we're actually doing. When you're a real quantum physicist, you are solving the Schrodinger equation and you are getting these quantum numbers uh, based upon the mathematical predictions from the Schrodinger equation. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the uh, OpenStax book here. So give me a moment. All right, so the first situation that we want to look at here is, again, you know, we're looking at a wave function for the, for, for the matter, where again, it's in the form of, it's not a particle any longer, it is now a wave. And um, give me a second here, let me get to the right picture that I want to show you. <clears throat> it's getting there. Should have went there first. All right, here we go. So let me uh, show my screen. Share my screen here. All right, so the. Um, so the idea is we have a wave. And a wave does not want to naturally fit in any space. So to fit it in a space, I mean, the idea is we're, we're trying to fit a wave that can be very much delocalized. I mean, again, I've done some calculations where I talk about the de Broglie wavelength of electrons. And there, you know, I think one of the questions I did in chapter 29, the de Broglie wavelength was like, the equivalent of 290 atomic diameters. So we're talking about uh, you know, a wavelength of a, of a matter wave that can range in, 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 in a, to a very large extent. And we're trying to fit this wave in a small space. How do you do that? And the idea is you want to fit it such that, remember, we're talking about trying to make an electron go around in an orbital. Now, we know it doesn't really go in an orbital, but it averages that way. All right, so the idea is the waves that 
are that are allowed in this orbital. If you imagine, here's an orbital of radius r. Again, I'm looking at. So again, the idea is, I mean, we're we're talking about trying to get in part in 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 a. We're seeing that we're we're going back to trying to do standing waves. But we're talking about standing waves now of matter waves. So we look at picture B. Picture B is I'm trying to fit a wavelength in an orbital of radius r. How do I do that? How do I fit a wave? So I'm drawing a wave around this circle such that you see in, in, in uh, part B. And the, the, and the way to do that is that the circumference of that circle, 2 pi r, has to be an integral multiple of the wavelengths where n is, a, n is an integer. So it could be 2 pi r could be one wavelength, 2 pi r could be two wavelengths, three wavelengths, so on and so forth. The, the wave has to constructively interfere with itself. Has to have basically a resonance. Now, an example of a wave that doesn't work, you see in part C. You see a wave that comes around and, you know, the one that's called a forbidden orbit because the wave, um, I can't, fit exactly a, a certain integer, integral number of wavelengths around that circumference. I can't do it. So that's an orbit that's forbidden. The only orbits that are allowed are orbits such that I can fit an integral number of matter waves, of electron matter waves in that orbit. Not every orbit uh, can, can do this. Only the allowed orbits, the orbits such that the electron wave wave can, the matter wave can constructively interfere with itself, like in part B. In part C, we have, we have a, a, an orbit that is forbidden because it does not constructively interfere with itself. Hence, it, it experiences destructive interference and cannot exist. Okay, we'll go back to the whiteboard. So again, the idea is um, for, for a circular orbit, we're gonna kind of go back and rely a little bit on the Bohr model to kind of uh, help, our, help our picture here. For a circular orbit, constructive interference occurs. So for a circular orbit, as I just showed, I, I can't possibly draw that picture. But for a circular orbit, So constructive interference occurs um, when the electron's wavelength Um, fits neatly into the circumference. Circumference of the circle. Circumference. All right. And what that, so essentially the crests line up and the troughs line up. So mathematically, what I'm saying is that an integral number of wavelengths, so I'll call n lambda sub n. So for the nth or for the nth radius, I can fit an integral number of wavelengths of electron wavelengths onto that circumference. So again, what's r sub n? So again, a lambda sub n 
is the de Broglie wavelength of the electron. Remember, electron is not a particle anymore. It is a wave. De Broglie, a wave, de Broglie wavelength of electron. R sub n is the nth radius, uh, orbital radius. Okay, so that's what it is. So, so, uh, so again, this is the equation. I must be able to fit n wavelengths so they constructively interfere with themselves. So they fit very nicely. On that, on, on the circumference of that circle, just like that picture showed. All right. Now, now we know that the the Broly wavelengths. Let me rewrite this equation now. Real estate purposes here. So again, I'm trying to fit n wavelengths, n matter waves on a circumference of a circle. But remember the de Broglie relation. Remember de Broglie relation is lambda is h over p. Lambda is h over p. And that's the de Broglie relationship. And again, you know, we're, we're not, we're talking about, uh, we're, we're being non-relativistic here. So we can write the, Momentum is just nothing more than MV, all right? Uh, so we can write now that um, lambda, again, for an, for an electron, and again, this is, M, this is M for an electron, all right? So again, we're talking about the mass of an electron, and M sub E. V is the velocity. So I can basically substitute right here. So I can say, well, I, I can write that N H over M sub E V is two pi R sub N. And all I'm doing is I'm substituting the de Broglie wavelength into the first equation I wrote down. You know, basically the constraint equation that says I must confine the wave of the of that describe the wavelength describes the electron onto this orbital radius onto this circle, and then I'll just rearrange. Let's see, I have m m v r. All right, so let's kind of write things out here. I have m sub e v r sub n, and that's going to equal what n h over two pi. Well, what is m sub e v r sub n? That's the angular momentum. And so what I get is a quantization of angular momentum. N equals one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. So angular momentum is quantized. That's what that says. Angular momentum is quantized. Now, this is what Bohr was forced to um, hypothesize, that, hypothesize as a rule. Realize, we realize that now that's a condition for constructive interference of an electron in a circular orbit. So again, quantization of angular momentum. Right? Niels Bohr had to hypothesize the quantization of angular momentum in his theory but we 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 now realize but we realize Um, 
that this condition for constructive this this is a condition for constructive interference of the electron in a circular orbit. So we realize that this is from the constructive interference. of an electron confined to a circular orbit. We have to fit the electron wave onto a circular orbit in order for that electron to be in that orbit. All right, so again, quantization of angular momentum comes from needing to fit the electron, which is now a wave, onto a circular orbit. Now, again, this is um, kind of a, you know, again, I'm trying to draw a, uh, a, a picture here for you. The reality is, um, you know, you can't actually. I mean, the, the, there's a wave character matter and the idea of well-defined orbits gives way to a model for the cloud of probability. Again, again, yes, we are using a Bohr picture right here to give us a, a physical understanding of why we have quantized angular momentum. But the reality is um, we really have a picture that uh, is really the electron is in a cloud of probability. I wanna, I'm gonna make that a caveat. You know, again, this is a helpful picture for us to draw upon. But because, because of the wave nature of matter, um, the idea of well-defined orbits gives way uh, to uh, a model in which there is a cloud of probability. We talked about that. Um, consistent with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uncertainty principle. So again, this goes back to the toward the end of chapter 29. So again, because of the wave nature of matter, the idea of a well-defined orbit or, or the, the idea of well-defined orbits gives way to a model which there is a cloud of probability consistent with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And we have to, we have to remember that. So if you try You try to follow the electron in some well-defined orbit using a probe. Uh, that has a small enough wavelength
um, to get some details Um, you will instead knock the electron out of the orbit. All right, so again, because the wave nature of matter the idea of a well-defined well -defined orbit gives way to a model in which there is a cloud of probability consistent with the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You try to follow the electron in a well-defined orbit using a probe that has a small enough wavelength to get some details, you will instead knock the electron out of its orbit. So again, you cannot know where anything is and what its momentum is any better than what the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle allows you to know. All right. Now, um, each measurement of electron. So, the, and the frustrating thing is, each measurement of the electron's position, you'll find it to be in a definite location uh, somewhere near the nucleus. Okay. So, so again, all you really can do is take is take uh, mo many many measurements to get an idea of a of a distribution. All right. So. And that's the nature of quantum mechanics, all right? So again, each measurement of the electron's position Each, each measure of electron's position will find it to be in a definite location somewhere near the nucleus. So you'll just take multiple measurements. So repeated measurements are built a cloud of probability with each spec, the location determined by a single measurement. So, so again, each measurement, I mean, so repeated measurements will be needed. So repeated measurements uh, will find, uh, will, will re, uh, reveal a cloud of probability. And uh, with each spec, the location determined by a single measurement. All right, so, so again, this is, there's not a well-defined circular orbit type of distribution. Again, nature proves to be different on a small scale. So again, um, there is uh, not a well-defined circular orbit type of distribution. Nature is very different on a small scale. And that's what quantum mechanics tells you.
So what you might see is something like this. So again, you know, this is kind of say here's space. And I just, uh, I'm essentially taking, again, I'm looking at the hydrogen atom, for instance. I'm just going to look at the hydrogen atom. And I want to try to figure out where that electron is. And so I'm going to end up seeing is more or less a cloud of probability that is going to be circular. So there's going to be various specs, again, all across this. It's going to fill out. I'm going to find a different way. I'm going to see that there's going to be heavier areas, let's say, where the electron is most likely going to be. And that would correspond, you know, averaging out to where we would call the orbital radius. But again, I can find it anywhere. I can find it in a nucleus. Area. So the darker regions are, are, are the areas where there will be higher probability of you finding the electron. But again, it's going to it's going to be for, it's going to basically form a cloud of probability. And the more in the in the more visited places will be statistically. You know where you're going to, you know where you would see, let's say, what we would call a classical orbit. So you know this most probable, you know. So again, this might be uh, r equals a sub b, the Bohr radius, and this would be, you know, what you would consider your r one classically. But again, it's just, you know, if you, you take different, you know, different, uh, different uh, measurements of the electron position, it's going to be all over the place. But again, over a large enough number of values, it's going to statistically uh, be like in these, in these various orbitals. And the orbitals are essentially the, the answers to, if you take the, if you find the wave function psi and you multiply psi star psi, the probability distribution that you get from that will describe this, uh, the statistics involved with uh, where are you going to find the electron? It depends on the complex square of the of the wave function from the which and the wave function is the is the solution to the Schrodinger equation. In the end, all right. So, and again, you have anytime you have um, a bound state, you're going to have Anytime you have a bound electron, you're going to have discrete energies. You're going to, get, you're going to have quantization. All right. So, so anytime the electron is bound, Uh, it will exhibit, it will quant, it will exhibit quantum behavior. With quantized energies. Angular momenta. Um, radii, etc. A free electron, when it's not bound, does not exhibit this quantum behavior. Only bound, only bound electrons will exhibit this kind of quantum behavior because, again, the discreteness deals with the fact you're trying to put a wave in a box. So does not exhibit such quantization since it is not being fit into a box. Or container will stay. Um, we saw this uh, with black body radiation. 
Okay, we also, we saw quantum behavior of black body radiation. We saw that as well because the radiators that is molecules, as well as uh, they're, 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 asked, they're, they're supposed to be fit into a small space. So again, the, the, the uh, electromagnetic radiators or oscillators were bound to the conducting cavity radiator. So again, you know, so now, Various as molecules have different sets of electron or electronic orbits depending upon their size and complexity. Again, we've seen things with you know the uh, hydrogen atom, but again, you know their quantum mechanics is true for any any atom. All right, so any any kind of atom or molecule. All right, so various atoms of molecules. Various atoms and molecules will have different sets of electronic orbits. And uh, depending on the size and complexity of the system. Now, when the system is very large, such as a grain of sand, the tiny particle waves that fit into it do so in so many ways, it becomes impossible to see the allowed states, uh, the, see the allowed states are actually discrete. So when you have a very large system, so when a system is large, You know, like a grain of sand, for instance, which is large compared with an atom. The, um, the tiny particle waves in it fit um, in so many ways uh, that it becomes impossible to see the allowed that the allowed states are discrete. And we get back to the classical world. 
and that's called the correspondence principle. Well, quantum mechanics passes very smoothly into the classical world. And we know these, these, these quantum states are true, but we don't see them when the system becomes very large. All right, so again, I've said this before, this is the correspondence principle. So the correspondence principle, so again, this is from Niels Bohr, one of the accomplishments of Niels Bohr is the correspondence principle. The correspondence principle is satisfied. Okay, basically as systems become large, they gradually look less green. And quantization becomes less evident. Well, we don't know about quantization. Evident. All right, so again, various atoms molecules will, um, have different set of electron states, all right? And so, um, so this has become, this is, a, this is, a, and so it, again, it depends on the size and complexity of the system. When a system is very large, like a grain of sand, the tiny particle waves that fit into it do so in so many ways that it becomes impossible to see the allowed states are discrete. Again, this is the correspondence principle that says that you know, when systems become more classical, quantum mechanics disappears, or at least the effects of it do, and 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 transition into classical physics. That's what the that's what the course correspondence principle of Niels Bohr states. Okay, so now um, if we look if we look at you know, so again, this is the again, this is the principal quantum number that deals uh, because of the fact that. You have to fit so many orbits onto it. You know, you have to fit you have to fit um, uh, a, a, a electron wave onto a circular orbit. But when we start looking at um, line spectra, we we see we see that there's evidence that there has to be more of these uh, some more of these uh, special uh, quantum numbers, right? And so. Um, and again, I, the full-blown Schrodinger equation is one where that was derived after a lot of the experimental uh, details I'm going to talk about were already worked out. Schrodinger tri Schrodinger's uh, quantum mechanics answered those questions, right? So when they were first worked out, people didn't really understand uh, initially why they are seeing certain phenomena. And the beauty about, the beauty about quantum, me quantum mechanics, one of the beauties about it is that it is very easy to see experimentally. You can set up a quant. Again, most tabletop, most quantum mechanics can be done on tabletop experiments. You can you can work in a sophomore level physics lab. All right. So any physics major in their sophomore year is going to work out most of the great Nobel uh, level quantum experiment experiments. Now, um, let's move on. Now, so we start seeing. We start talking about electric, uh, you know, spectra, and high resolution measurements of atomic molecular spectra show the spectral lines are even more complex than they first appear. So again, we get into higher resolution measurements now. So high resolution measurements. Uh, atomic and molecular spectra. Uh, 
show that the spectral lines are even more complex than they first appear, than they first appear. We're going, to, we're going back to looking at the spectral lines. And, you know, initially they, you know, when we didn't have as a high precision of measurements, they appeared, you know, uh, complex enough, but as you take a closer look, they're even more complex. And so, first of all, um, we talk about, you know, the experience. And so we have, so we have, um, so essentially, we start talking about the work done by uh, Lorentz and his student Zeman. Okay, it's a very important experiment. So in order to explore the substructure of atoms, okay, so again, we're talking about the turn of the century, or again, it's right around 1900. And you know, the work done by J.J. Thompson, you see that there's a substructure of atoms we call electrons. Okay, and so we know from J.J. Thompson's experiments that magnetic fields affected electrons. So, to, so one of the thing, one of the things that um, uh, you know was a question on the mind of you know the great Henry Henri Antoine Lorentz is if you have electrons and atoms, would they be affected by magnetic fields? Again, these line spectra are because of electronic transitions. We think. And so would they be affected by magnetic fields? So, so again, we're talking about the turn of the century. So in order to explore the substructure of atoms, Um, and knowing that magnetic fields affect moving charges, Um, again, the great Dutch physicist, uh, Henrik Lorentz, And Lorentz, again, he's the same as the Lorentz force law. So a person who's going to understand magnetism is this guy, 1853 to 1930 is how long he lived. And uh, suggested that his student, Pieter Zeman Zeman lived uh, from 1865 to 1943. Um, study how spectrum might be affected by magnetic fields. affected by magnetic field. <clears throat> Logical thing to do. So again, who's going to understand magnetism better than Lorentz? 
So again, um, in order to explore the substructure atoms, again, we're due to the work uh, done by um, uh, J.J. Thompson, knowing that electrons exist, knowing that they're in atoms, knowing that moving charges are affected by magnetic fields, a natural thing the great Dutch physicist Hendrik Lorentz uh, suggested to a student, Pieter Zeman, is what happens when you apply a magnetic field to an atom? Okay, so what Zeman saw was something remarkable. So again, he applied the magnetic field to an atom. All right. Um, what they found became known as the Zeeman effect. All right, and um, so which basically involves spectral lines being split into two or two or more separate emission lines by an external magnetic field. So what you saw was a spectral line. Um, so basically, which involved spectral lines being split into two or more separate emission lines. Um, by an external magnetic field. And so an example, so again, for their discovery, it's a very big deal for their discovery Uh, Lorenz, Lorenz and Zeman shared a 1902 Nobel Prize in Physics. Shared 1902. So again, this was done right around the time of Thompson. They're getting Nobel Prize in 1902. Nobel Prize in Physics. So what did they see? Well, if I have an external magnetic field of zero, for instance, I might see something like this. So again, I have a couple of different, you know, so I, I'll have a, let's say a spectral line, a couple of spectral lines. And that is my external field is zero. I have no external magnetic field. I just see a couple of spectral lines. You know, there's one here and one here like I normally would. And now let's just take a look that of a um, magnetic field that I, I now apply to the to the um, to the atom. So once I apply a magnetic field, what happens here is they get split into say three or five. Spectral lines. So this one over here now becomes separated out into like three lines. And let's say maybe this one here might become separated into five lines. And B external not equal to zero. And if I apply a larger B external, they separate out even more. So now if I apply a large field, these same lines these same three lines get split even more. Now they split up even more. 
apart. And the ones over here, they split even more apart. So B external large, the large B external. And I'm applying an external magnetic field. If I don't apply the external magnetic field, all I see is, I just see a couple of spectral lines in the, in the emission spectrum. But now let's say I apply a, you know, I, I apply a medium-sized magnetic field, an external magnetic field. And let's say, you know, sometimes they split into three, sometimes they split into five, so on and so forth. They become compl complicated. So like say, say this line on the left becomes now three lines. And this line on the right becomes five lines. And if I make the external field large, larger, I don't get any more lines, they just separate more. Okay, this is called the Zeeman effect, where, where you had a couple of spectral lines before, now you have multiple spectral lines. And those spectral lines, as you, as you crank up the magnetic field, as you make the magnetic field, external magnetic field larger, the applied external magnetic field larger, those lines separate more and more. All right, so this is the Zeeman effect. Zeeman and Lorentz won a 1902 Nobel Prize for it, right? And so, again, what does this mean? What, why is this significant? All right, so Zeeman splitting, again, is complex or complicated. <clears throat> I'll say complex, but not in the... Not in a real imaginary type, right? Complex meaning complicated, all right? Uh, some lines split into three lines. Some spectral lines split into three lines. Uh, some into five and so on. just like you saw in that picture. And also the amount of the split lines are separated is proportional to the applied magnetic field strength. So the amount that the lines are separated Uh, is proportional to the applied magnetic field strength. We saw that in the rightmost picture that I drew. So, that, so th this indicates that there is an interaction with the moving charge, All right? So this inter so this indicates so this particular behavior this 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 behavior indicates that there is an interaction. with a moving charge. All right, so, so basically the splitting means that the quantized energy of an orbit is affected by the external magnetic field, causing the orbit uh, to have several discrete energies in, instead of one. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, so let's, let's, so let's try to figure out what's actually going on here, all right? So again, we see that empirically that we apply an external magnetic field and the 
and the spectral lines split into multiple spectral lines. All right, multiple wave, multiple um, wavelengths. So what what does this mean? Well, the the splitting. So the splitting means the quantized energy of an orbit. Um, is affected by an external magnetic field. Okay, so the splitting means that the that the quantized energy of the orbit is affected by an external magnetic field. Causing the orbit to have several discrete energies instead of one. And this, again, you know, a, a, a line spectrum means there's a, there is a, there is a, a an electronic transition of a particular energy, right? So it's going to cause the orbit to have several discrete energies instead of one. Okay. And so um, even without an external magnetic field, very precise measurements show the spectral lines are actually doublets. So even if you don't even have an external magnetic field, if you take a close enough look, the actual spectral lines are not single lines. They're actually very closely associated doublets. And in fact, um, so, so essentially, so essentially there's magnetic field, there must be magnetic fields within the atom itself. So again, even more complicated, even without an external magnetic field. And we'll talk about the doublets in a moment. Even if you don't even apply an external magnetic field. Um, very precise measurements. Um, showed that spectral lines are actually are, are doublets, are actually doublets. And um, split into two, basically. Apparently by magnetic fields within the atom itself. This is called fine structure. And we'll talk about fine structure in a moment. But let's talk about the situation with the external magnetic field. So we can actually use Bohr's theory 
Bohr's model to kind of give us a good picture again, like we did with the like we did with the uh, fitting trying to fit the the waves, the wave, the matter waves of the electron onto a circular orbit. We can actually use Bohr's theory circular orbits again to try to understand the situation with this, these discrete splittings. So again, the splitting that splitting means again that quantized energy of an orbit is affected by external magnetic field, causing the orbit to have several discrete energy instead of one. And again, even more complicated than that, what we thought were, were single spectral lines are actually doublets. They're actually two very closely associated spectral lines. So line spectral is not, is not as simple as we initially thought it was. It's much more complicated, much more complex. But let's take a look at how we can understand, first of all, the Zeeman effect uh, by applying kind of a Bohr, a Bohr type model uh, for a moment, all right? Just imagine a circular orbit with electron going around. All right, so, so Bohr's theory of circular orbits um, is useful for visualizing how electrons orbit is affected by a magnetic field. All right, so again, Bohr's theory of circular orbits is useful in visualizing how an electron's orbit is affected by a magnetic field. So let's take a look. Let's kind of imagine a circular orbit for a moment. Go back to Bohr for a moment. Let's kind of draw our circular orbit. And so we have an axis here. All right, and um, in the center of the axis, we're going to imagine there's an electron going around in the, in, in the circular orbit. Here's our electron. The electron is going to have an orbital velocity, V sub E, or we'll say V for the electron. And it's going to have a certain radius, maybe R. All right. Now, a couple of things are going on here. Um, because, so, so essentially, if you think about this here for a moment, the electron is, we're talking about electron, it has a mass. So again, we'll say this is m sub e. This is our electron going around in a circular orbit of radius r. So first of all, it has a mass. There's a mass going around with an, with an angular velocity v. First of all, we can specify there is an orbital magnetic moment, all right? So again, an orbital magnetic moment is given by what? r cross p. Again, P is the momentum of the electron. And of course, we're talking about circular orbits, so the angle between the radial and the, and the tangential velocity is 90 degrees. That would be RP, the magnitude of R magnitude P times the sine of 90 degrees, the sine of the angle between them. What direction? Again, if I use my right-hand rule, I curl my fingers in the direction of the orbit. My, the orbital angular momentum is straight up along the axis. I would refer to, so my direction of angular momentum is straight up along the axis. I'll call that L orb. That's my direction of angular momentum for the spinning electron. So again, what is P? Well, again, classically, the momentum is mass times velocity. So M sub E times V. So again, the angular momentum I'll just look at the magnitude, is m sub e v r, we'll say this is the radius, and then sine of theta, sine of 90 degrees is of course equal to one. So again, I have an angular momentum and it's straight up, but I also have a circulating charge, basically a current. What does Ampere's law tell me? Ampere's law says, oh, you have a circulating current. Put your fingers in the direction of the current. 
the magnetic field is, is along the line. Again, there's always a curly part and a straight part. However, the electron is negative. It means I flip at the last, at the last second. So the, the orbital, angle, so there's an orbital magnetic field going straight down caused by this spinning, this, uh, this re revolving charge. So by Ampere's law, The orbiting charge creates a downward magnetic field. So the elect the atom itself is a magnet. The atom itself is a magnet. The atom is like a bar magnet. It's a magnetic object. It has, because it is a charge going around the circle, it has an orbital magnetic field. All right, so they're along the same line. We have an orbital magnetic field and an orbital angular momentum. All right, and so again, let's uh, let me kind of put these in words here. So, um, B orb is the orbital magnetic field. Okay, uh, L orb is the orbital magnetic moment, or I'm sorry, orbital angular momentum. Okay, now, um, Interestingly speaking, B orb and L orb are anti parallel. And they're, they're along the same line, but it is pointing in opposite directions, as I, as I demonstrated a moment ago. Now, when we apply when we apply an external magnetic field. So, so, so first of all, let's, let's go back to electricity and magnetism one more time. We can, we can refer to the, um, the atom, with the electron revolving in a circle. As having a magnetic moment. And I talked about this in the very beginning of magnetism. All right, so an external magnetic field so an ex so the magnetic moment for it, this circle is um, you can write this as the magnetic moment. it is a vector. It's a vector again that points along the uh, again it points. In the direction of the uh, of the of the uh, angular momentum, 
mu is going to be, we call it in general, N I A. And uh, in general, uh, A is an area vector. I is the current. Again, current is circular current. And in general, N, again, going back to uh, uh, electricity magnetism, N is number of turns of wire. All right. So you can kind of think of this as like a wire. N would be one in our case, right? But, but in general, um, if I had a wire with a current going around, and there's an area, the area, remember area in physics is a vector pointing along the normal direction. My magnetic moment would be NIA. And remember when, I, when I'm talking about magnetizing an object, when I apply external magnetic field, what happens to magnetic moments? They line up with the external magnetic field. Again, I talked about this in the, in the very beginning of magnetism. So the magnetic moments So the magnetic moment, the magnetic moment of an atom uh, tends to align with an external magnetic field be external. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna erase some of these, these words here for real estate. So essentially, be external. Why is it aligned like this? Why, why would a magnetic moment align like this? Well, because it experiences a torque. Again, this goes back to, again, electricity magnetism. Uh, be external, so the, so the atom, or the magnetic moment of the atom, Mu experiences a torque caused by the external magnetic field. given by torque is mu cross B external. Mu cross B. The energy associated, so again, it has a tendency to want to align, change the angle. You know, if, the, if the magnetic field is going this way, where it's going to change the angle of the magnetic moment uh, to be realigned. There's an energy associated with this. So the energy associated with Aligning the magnetic moment with the external magnetic field is given by U. Usually we 
oftentimes refer to energies, we call them U in physics. U, capital U, is given as mu dot the external, the dot product. All right, so again, the torque cause on tor the, the torque that the magnetic moment feels because the external magnetic field is given by tau as mu cross V. That's the cross product in, in physics. And the energy associated with aligning the magnetic moment with the external magnetic field is given by mu equals mu dot V external, the dot product. Okay, so. So basically, because of this relationship, mu dot b, what we see here, this is not too surprising, is essentially um, orbits of, at different angles to the magnetic field have different energies. Again, that's given by mu dot b. So what this tells you is that orbits, orbits of, um, at different angles, again, different tilt angles, to the external magnetic field, Um, have different energies. I mean, again, you know, if it's U is mu dot B, that's my energy for a given angle. Remember the dot product, right? It's the magnitude of one vector mu times the magnitude of the other vector, I apologize, the external. It's the magnitude of one vector, mu, times the magnitude of the magnetic field, B external, times the cosine of the angle between them. All right, so again, that's not surprising. What's remarkable is that these energies are quantized. That's what's remarkable. These energies are quantized. So again, you know what, everything I've talked about here is classical physics up until now. So yeah, you know, you have a magnetic moment and an external magnetic field, yep, mu dot B. But what is remarkable is that these alignment energies you are quantized. That is unexpected. That is what the Zeeman effect tells us. And what does that mean? You know, the magnetic field splits the spectral lines into several discrete lines that have different energies. So again, that's where the quant, you know, so the mag so the magnetic field splits um, the um, the lines, the spectral lines um into several discrete lines that have different energies. All right, so that means looking at this, looking at this, so, so if U is discrete, magnetic, uh, again, a magnetic moment's not going to change. And I mean, so because N is one, you know, again, it's not a wire. 
I is, you know, that is the left rear field per unit time going around. Uh, a is going to be the same uh, area of the orbit. So the only thing that's going to change is, ang is the angle. So that means that if the energies are discrete, the angles are discrete. All right. So the splitting, the splitting means that the quantized energy of an orbit is affected by the external magnetic field causing the orbit. So again, let me write this better. So again, looking at this relationship, the, the splitting means, so again, the Zeeman splitting, the Zeeman splitting means, uh, that the quantized energy of an orbit affected by is affected by an internal magnetic field. Uh, actually, so the same. So again, the same on splitting. So the same on splitting. Indicating that the energies U is, are quantized. What I just got done writing writing on the on the board. So U equaling mu B external cosine theta are quantized. Indicate or mean or indicate that only certain angles are allowed between the orbital angular momentum and the external magnetic field. So it indicate that only certain angles. are allowed, not all the angles, only certain angles are allowed between the orbital angular momentum which remember is, again, is opposite the orbital uh, magnetic field and the external magnetic field. Only certain angles are allowed. So again, what does this look like? So again, only certain angles are allowed between the orbital angular momentum and the external magnetic field. So if I were to draw a diagram of this, What this means is that, well, let's imagine that I have an external magnetic field as stated. This is the external. Well, that means that if that, that's going to define my C-axis. And again, the C-axis, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain this more, the C-axis is defined as the axis where something changes. I mean, that's due to relativity. Relativity says that a direction only matters if something's changing that direction. So again, the C axis, we define the Z axis in quantum mechanics as the special direction or something is changing.
due to relativity. Uh, this is a statement from relativity. So the direction of magnetic field is special. So the direction of magnetic field is such a direction. And so we define the z-axis here. Now, otherwise, where do you define the z-axis? What makes one direction particularly special? Well, it's a direction where something changes. So in this case, a magnetic field. All right, so what this is saying is that there's only allowed energies. So in the same on splitting, if I have five, if I, I see five lines, I got maybe this would be an L orbital, one here, one here. So I'd have five different angles between the, between, and these are all different orbital angular momenta. There would be allowed angles between the orbital angular momentum and the external magnetic field. Only certain allowed angles of the orbital angular momentum and the external magnetic field or the Z axis. All right, so this is very special. So we already know. that the magnitude of the angular momentum is quantized for electrons or electron orbits and atoms. So where we, where we determine that? By fitting, by fitting um, uh, electron waves on a circular orbit. So we already know that the magnitude of the orbital angular momentum is quantized um, for elect electron orbits and atoms. Magnitude is quantized. This new insight right here, this new insight uh, is that the direction of orbital angular momentum is also separately quantized. So this new insight is that the direction of orbital angular momentum is separately quantized we have another quantization condition one quantization condition on the magnitude of the orbital angular momentum another quantization condition on the direction of the orbital angular momentum they are separately quantized okay the fact that orbital angular momentum can have only certain directions is called space quantization. And that's what it's called. So the fact that orbital angular momentum uh, 
can only have certain directions. Is called space quantization. That's the official term. All right, so what we just discovered here, the fact that orbital angular momentum can only have certain directions is called space quantization. Again, like all aspects of quantum mechanics, this quantization is totally unexpected. All right, so again, um, totally by surprise. All right, so again, <clears throat> So like many uh, aspects of quantum mechanics, um, the quantization of direction of angular momentum is totally unexpected. Quantization of the direction of orbital angular momentum is totally unexpected. Um, now, in a, on a macroscopic scale, orbital angular momentum can, uh, such as that of a of a moon around the Earth, can have any magnitude in any direction, right? So, on macroscopically, the orbital angular momentum. of a body like the moon revolving around the earth can have any magnitude in any direction. So we don't see this kind of behavior um, macroscopically. Submacroscopically, the magnitude and the direction of orbital angular momentum is quantized. It can only take on certain values in its magnitude and only certain values in its angle and its direction. All right, and so now space quantization, um, detailed treatment of space quantization began to explain some complexities of comic spectra. So detailed treatment, of space quantization uh, began to explain some complexities of atomic spectra. Uh, 
but certain patterns seem to be caused by something else. Right. So quant detail driven a, a space quantization, uh, you know, can explain a lot of the complexities of the atomic spectra, but we still need uh, something else. Again, we talked about the fine structure. So the fact that um, the fact that spectral lines, are really doublets cannot be explained by space, space quantization. This is the fine structure I talked about. What explains it? Right, so space quantization does not explain why spectral lines, uh, if you look closely enough, even in the absence of magnetic fields appear as doublets. So again, what would a what would a fine structure uh, look like? So again, if I were to if I were to take a look at a couple of spectral lines, just kind of like I like I showed before. So I said, well, you know, if I'm not if I'm not a if I'm not looking closely enough, I just see a couple of spectral lines. But if I take a really close look. This line really looks like a doublet, a very, very fine doublet. And this line over here also looks like a very fine doublet. Should why not? Very too closely associated spectral line. If I look at them uh, very carefully, again, this is the fine structure. All right, so the doublet changes when a magnetic field is applied. So again, it also is with respect to magnetic field. So the doublet changes when a magnetic field is applied. So it's there with or without a magnetic field, but it changes when a magnetic field is applied, an external magnetic field is applied. <clears throat> okay, so so this so this implies that the that whatever causes the doublet interacts with the magnetic field. All right, so this was a mystery, the doublet. So it was solved by a, actually a couple of graduate students, if I recall. So in 1925, 
Uh, Sam Goodsman. And uh, George Ullenbeck. Um, two Dutch physicists. Uh, proposed um, or successfully argued that the um, that electrons have properties analogous to a macroscopic charge spinning on its axis. All right, so again, to try to explain this, uh, so a doublet changes when an external magnetic field is applied. So a doublet actually splits further and further. So this implies that whatever causes the doublet interacts with the magnetic field. So, so this was solved by a couple of Dutch physicists in 1925, Sam Gutsmit and George Uhlenbeck. Um, their two Dutch physicists have successfully argued that electrons have properties analogous to a macroscopic charge spinning on its axis. You can think of electrons like a little planet spinning on its axis. All right. So so again, this would be a spinning charge. This would be a charge that would have Kind of like you know you have the revolving you have the charge that's going around in an orbit well now you have another charge that's spinning that would cause a magnetic field as well so electrons in fact um have an internal or intrinsic angular momentum called intrinsic spin s Intrinsic uh, angular momentum called intrinsic spin cap S. So it's a spin angular momentum. Again, it's, it's an, uh, an object spinning on its axis uh, roughly. So electrons are charged, their intrinsic spin creates an intrinsic magnetic field at the end. So again, it's a spinning charge. So since electrons have charge, Um, their intrinsic spin um, creates an intrinsic magnetic field B in.
Okay. So again, a spinning uh, a re, a orbiting charge or a spinning charge creates what by Ampere's law? Uh, it would be, we can think of it as having an internal magnetic field as well, just like there's a, our intrinsic magnetic field, just like we had an orbital magnetic field for, um, for the uh, electron in an orbit. And that's, and, and in fact, this uh, intrinsic spin actually interacts with the orbital magnetic field B orb. They actually interact with each other. Call that spin orbit coupling. So this is called officially spin orbit coupling. Okay. Um, so further electron. So so again, we have uh, you know you could think of this roughly as a spinning charge, kind of like you know, kind of like an. Uh, 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 a planet going around, you know, uh, uh, you know, a planetary motion, right? You have one uh, motion of the Earth, for instance, going around the sun, that would be like an orbital motion, but the Earth also spins on its axis as it's going around the sun too. So you can think of it analogously like this. I mean, again, the, you know, the electron going around the orbit is like, is like the, you know, it's like the Earth going around the sun and the electron spin is like the Earth spinning on its axis. Again, it's analogous. And again, there's not a, a direct analogy because again, this is quantum mechanics, all right? So we have, again, a, a, an intrinsic spin S, okay? So, now um, the electron intrinsic spin is quantized in magnitude and direction and more quantum mechanics. So, so again, this, Electron intrinsic spin. Just like orbital angular momentum, electron intrinsic spin is quantized. Both in magnitude and direction. Okay, again, very important concept. Elect electron intrinsic spin is quantized in both magnitude and direction. All right. And this is analogous. To the situation. with the orbital angular momentum. We saw that it was also quantized separately in, in magnitude and direction. All right, so then again, two more forms of quantization. Okay. Um, the spin of an electron can, only, can have only one magnitude and, and direction, all right? So the spin, the spin of an electron can have only one magnitude and direction. Right now, um, and its direction can only be one of two angles relative to the magnetic field. Okay. 
All right, um, refer to this as spin up or spin down for the electron. Spin up or spin down. For the electron. All right, so the electron will find out it can only have one magnitude of, of the spin uh, angular momentum. And this direction is either spin up with the magnetic field or spin down. No other direction is allowed, depending upon the magnetic field. So each spin direction have a different energy, hence spectroscopic lines are split into two. So again, you know, the, uh, and again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about the Pauli exclusion principle. I talked about every electron has a partner. Well, one partner spin up, the other partner spin down. They can be together, but one has to be spin up, and the other one has to be spin down, all right? And they have different energies because of these different spin orientations, all right? So again, we'll get more into this when we talk about the uh, Pauli exclusion principle later. So each spin direction has a different energy. Hence, spectroscopic lines are split into two, the doubles. So spectral doublets are now understood to, to, uh, for, as being due to electron spin. All right, so spectral, so, uh, spectral doublets. Are now understood. To be due To electron spin now in the uh, next video um, I'm going to talk about the generalized quantum mechanics where we're going to find out that these that these quantizations all are with respect to selection rules and special quantum numbers and that allows us to understand first of all how do we specify an electron in its orbits, how do we specify what transitions are allowed? So again, that's like really like the, le the next and, and close to the last section that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, we're going to put it all together and employ the, the Pauli exclusion principle um, in the very end. So this is going to this is going to explain exactly how does your chemistry work? You know, the chemistry that you study, you know, the Pauli exclusion principle, all of this is, is a is atomic physics, applied physics of the atom.